Hello, everyone. Everyone seated here in our full house and everyone online who's watching this virtually. My name is William Wexler. I am the director of the Rafiq Hariri Center in Middle East Programs here at the Atlantic Council. And it gives me great joy to uh, kick off this, um, this, this full day of discussions about an issue that is near and dear to my heart, and, but yet doesn't get nearly the attention that it deserves, which is Syria. Um, Syria uh, has, has um, been a festering problem for the region for far too long. The people of Syria have suffered far too much. Too many outside um, uh, actors have become involved in ways that are not constructive to the uh, future of Syria, and it suffers under continued leadership uh, from Damascus, which is, uh, remains a burden to the Syrian people. Um, we are going to uh, kick off this, um, uh, this launch of our new Syria strategy project, a multilateral transatlantic partnership between the Atlantic Council, the Middle East Institute, and the European Institute of Peace to produce a realistic, implementable, serious strategy for the U.S. and its allies and its partners across the Atlantic. Um, this is a, a knotty problem that, um, that multiple U.S. administrations have struggled to get their hands around, have chosen to ignore in too many areas, and we are going to try to become part of the solution set um, to that. In doing so, uh, we have the great honor to have the support of Ayman Asfari, uh, the chairman of the Madanya Civil Society Network, uh, without whom we would not be here today. Um, he is the uh, co-founder, chairman, and principal benefactor of the Asfari Foundation, which has provided support to Middle Eastern civil society organizations since 2006 with a particular focus on Syria. In 2012, the foundation established the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship at American University in Beirut. He was a member of the Board of Trustees there. He's also on the board of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, serves as the Chatham House Panel of Senior Advisors. Mr. Asfari, please join us. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, let me first uh, say a couple of words about Madania. Madania is a platform for over 200 Syrian civil society organizations working across all sectors and geographies inside and outside Syria, aimed at reclaiming the political agency of the Syrian civic space. The aim precisely frames the engagement of Madania in the Syria strategy project that is being launched today. I would say that if there is any silver uh, lining from the uh, Syrian uprising, it's the fact that over the last th 13 years, we have a very mature and, uh, and active uh, 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 civil society that did not exist before 2011. Syria's conflict has evolved into a protracted crisis marked by escalating humanitarian and human rights concerns alongside the stagnant political process. Meanwhile, the regional normalization efforts are gaining momentum while international attention to the situation dwindles. Addressing the Syrian conflict is no longer solely a domestic issue. Uh, it's with its spillage into regional and international realms, resolving it has become imperative for regional and global security. Consequently, Syria must reclaim its central position in international diplomacy and policy-making effort. Unfortunately, I've been coming to Washington for the last 13 years, and the last uh, five or six years, uh, the, the Syria crisis is always being addressed as either a humanitarian crisis, so there is focus on cross-border access and, uh, and the UN resolutions when it comes, and obviously, as a counterterrorism uh, crisis with the, with, the, uh, with the question of the uh, ISIS in the Northeast, uh, then everyone talks about a commitment to a political solution in 2254. But we've seen very, very little action taking place to ensure that 2254 is implementable. Syrian civil society has consistently been at the forefront, not only in mitigating the conflict's impact, but also in devising strategies to tackle its underlying causes, advocating for justice and accountability every step of the way. 
This remarkable endeavor by Syrians must resonate within the highest levels of international and regional decision-making bodies. Despite the consensus amongst most international and regional powers that the principal political solution in Syria is imperative, genuine strategies to create and implement such a solution are still lacking. Madania acknowledges this gap and is therefore collaborating with leading research institutions in the US and the EU to address it at the decision-making centers, emphasizing that the process to bridge this gap and its resulting outcomes must be with a strong Syrian contribution. Simultaneously, Madania is initiating a parallel Syrian-led dialogue amongst our 200 member organizations that will convene all the Syrian civil society organization members in Madania uh, in all regions to formulate a roadmap for implementing the UN Security Council Resolution 2254 in a principal manner. The Syrian perspective on who to, how 2254 can be applied beyond the current stalled political process confined to the Constitutional Committee will contribute to the Syria strategy project, this Syria strategy project on various funds fostering the right synergies. We firmly believe that both trajectories can complement each other, paving the way for a principled political solution ultimately driven by Syrians themselves. Thank you so much. We really look forward to, this is the launch of our project. We thank the Atlantic Council, the Middle East Institute, and the European Institute for Peace for uh, um, taking on this responsibility. And thank you all for your presence today. I hope this will be a, a, a beginning for a very successful project. Thank you. Hello, it's a great honor to address you at the launch of this Syria strategy project, and I wish I could have been there with you in person today. Speaking on behalf of those in government, we are always eager to hear ideas that reflect creative and pragmatic thinking, especially on a situation as complex as Syria. We look forward to hearing the outcome of your discussions. This month we mark the 13th anniversary of the Syrian uprising. We recognize with you the Syrian people's sacrifice over these years in an unstinting and painful quest to build a free and democratic Syria. My teams at the State Department and at the Syria regional platforms in Istanbul and Amman continue to meet with the opposition, civil society members, diaspora leadership, and humanitarian actors. Your constant feedback, analysis, and assessments of the situation on the ground continue to inform our decision-making and help us refine our policy direction. The situation in Syria is unquestionably dire. The political situation is deadlocked and the humanitarian situation continues to deteriorate dramatically. Deadly bombardment campaigns in northwest and northeast Syria persist. Parties to the conflict continue to abuse human rights and over 155,000 people remain arbitrarily detained or forcibly disappeared. And now with the war in Gaza, we're committed to ensuring Syria itself does not get pulled into a regional conflict that only increases human suffering. Since 2022, our policy priorities have, in Syria have by and large remained the same because Syria's primary struggles have not been resolved. We remain committed to expanding humanitarian access, to ensuring the enduring defeat of ISIS, to supporting local ceasefires, and to promoting accountability for the Assad regime's atrocities by advancing respect for human rights and justice for victims and survivors. We remain engaged in a political process consistent with UN Security Council Resolution 2254, despite consistent stonewalling by the Syrian regime and Russia. We support the efforts of UN Special Envoy Gary Peterson, whose work to facilitate the work of the Constitutional Committee. While the process has yet to bear fruit, it remains the only process that calls for government, opposition, and civil society stakeholders to sit at one table. For this reason, we still believe, despite Russian and regime intransigence, that this mechanism is relevant. Last summer, the Arab League lifted its suspension of Syria from the League, a move we warned against, particularly without any guarantees of political reforms. Our position is clear will not normalize relations with the Assad regime absent genuine progress towards an enduring political solution to the conflict. In an effort to utilize every avenue in resolving the Syrian crisis, we continue to stress to partners that credible steps to improve the humanitarian, human rights, and security situation for Syrians should be front and center in any engagement with the regime. And while we, and now they, remain skeptical of Assad's commitment to any reforms, we want to exhaust every opportunity
to provide a better, more secure, and dignified life for Syrians. The entire U.S. government remains engaged as well. The departments of state and treasury are working tirelessly to ensure our sanctions are targeting the Assad regime and other bad actors, not impoverished Syrians. We're also working closely with USAID to encourage investment across northern Syria under General License 22, a move we think will truly aid in development of the region. Our humanitarian colleagues remain relentless in their work to get life-saving aid to those in need. And our stabilization teams are doing vital work to build community resilience against ISIS, speed the return and reintegration of families from El Hol, bolster civil society and independent media, and more. We continue to support Syrian civil society's collection, analysis, and preservation of evidence of human rights violations to support accountability and transitional justice processes, including identification of the missing. Last summer, we were proud to support the creation of the new UN Independent Institution on Missing Persons in Syria. That effort was led by Syrian families and survivors, seeking the release of and more information on their missing loved ones. We're working now to operationalize this institution, ensuring it is fully funded and staffed by the world's best experts. In Northeast Syria, the fight against ISIS continues. Our partners on the ground, the SDF, continue to work to counter a threat that poses a danger, not just to Syrians, but to the region and the world. We remain committed to the mission, which includes repatriating non-Syrians to their countries of origin from both detention centers and displaced persons camps. I know that none of you have given up. None of you have lost hope. And that's exactly why I'm speaking to you today, to let you know that the U.S. government has not lost hope either and continues to work to resolve this terrible conflict and to ensure that there is justice and accountability for all the atrocities that have been committed. I applaud the perseverance of the Syrian people, and I thank you for the inspiration you've been to so many of us as we too continue all efforts to bring a brighter future to Syria and its people. So let me say congratulations and thank you again, Kutaiba, Charles and Marie for giving me the opportunity to celebrate the launch of this great initiative. Thank you, Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Barbara Leaf. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you to our discussion on the state of Syria diplomacy today. I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn, the State Department correspondent for Al Monitor, and I have the pleasure of speaking with today Brigitte Kermy, the French ambassador for Syria. Joining us virtually is Stefan Schneck, the German special envoy to Syria. And finally, Ethan Goldrich, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, who at the State Department holds the responsibility for Syria and the Levant. Thank you, each of you, for being here today. And to our audience, both in studio and watching virtually, be thinking of questions. You can submit them to askac.org, and we'll save some time at the end for those. Um, but first, to our panel, for the past 13 years, the United States and Europe have maintained economic pressure and diplomatic isolation of the Syrian regime while advocating for a political process that would culminate with free and fair elections and a new constitution. But that political process is paralyzed. Bashar al-Assad remains entrenched in power. A mix of Kurdish fighters, jihadists, and Turkey-backed groups control swaths of northern and eastern Syria, and ISIS maintains a low-level insurgency. Syria is fractured, and while the world is largely focused on other wars in Gaza and Ukraine, Syria's humanitarian crisis has only deepened. My question for the three of you is, is it time to acknowledge that the status quo approach to Syria isn't working? Is a new strategy needed? Good. Um, well, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you. And uh, I'll, uh, at least to your first question, have more of a prepared response and then uh, look forward to the additional uh, questions if that's okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, thanks uh, to the Middle East Institute and to the Atlantic Council and European Institute for Peace uh, for uh, having us today and organizing the event um, and uh, for bringing me together with 
uh, Brigitte, my French colleague, and Stefan, my German colleague, who I frequently uh, am working on uh, the kinds of questions I think you're addressing in the conference today. So it's great to have a chance to uh, share with all of you uh, what uh, we think about the questions that you're dealing with. Um, and uh, we're um, grateful that there's an innovative initiative going on uh, to uh, figure out what else can be done and to look at creative and pragmatic strategies. Um, I think uh, whatever uh, this conference comes up with, I think we're gonna look forward to hearing it and it's gonna inform our own thinking as well. Um, so uh, marking the 13th anniversary of the beginning of the uprising against the Assad regime and the situation in Syria continues to worsen. Um, we see the regime is continuing to escalate its attacks, especially in the Northwest, where lingering humanitarian issues from the February 2023 earthquake present additional challenges to an already dire conflict. And as the number of Syrians in need of humanitarian aid continues to increase, the United States' priority is that all modalities of humanitarian access for all Syrians are not hindered and reach those uh, in where, uh, need wherever they are. Um, we've been extremely wary about the regime's attempts to rehabilitate its image and to normalize with its neighbors uh, and with others, uh, and it's trying to do that absent any meaningful engagement or reform. And as you just heard from my boss, Assistant Secretary Leaf, uh, we don't agree, uh, did not agree with the Arab League decision to reinstate Syria's membership, uh, but we have been uh, steadfast in our policy not to normalize our own relations with the regime um, until uh, it makes genuine progress toward an enduring political solution. And uh, your question, I think, is well stated that at the moment uh, we're not making progress toward that solution. Um, we're working closely uh, with France, uh, with uh, the UK, Germany, the EU, um, uh, to hold the line on the position and to ensure that other like-minded partners adopt the same approach. Uh, but our ultimate goal is to use diplomatic tools at our disposal to push the regime to finally engage meaningfully in UN-facilitated political negotiations with the Syrian opposition and to take authentic steps toward reforms in line with Security Council Resolution 2254. To that end, we have had numerous conversations with our partners here, as well as with the UN Special Envoy's office and with our Arab friends to identify ways to generate new momentum toward a political solution. But there can be no lasting political solution without accountability and justice for the atrocities and violations and abuses committed against Syrians. So we continue to push for accountability for injustices perpetrated by the Assad regime and by others. And we're deeply disturbed by the ongoing human rights abuses, as well as the Assad regime's more than a decade long history of brutality uh, against the men, women, and children uh, in Syria, including the regime's use of chemical weapons against its own people. As over 155,000 people in Syria remain arbitrarily detained or forcibly disappeared, mostly by the regime, we cannot falter or stall on pressing for progress on the status of these individuals, which is necessary in pursuing lasting peace and stability in Syria. Ultimately, peace and stability in Syria over the long term can only be reached if there is a lasting political settlement to the crisis. The U.S. remains committed to the U.N.-facilitated Syrian-led process to resolve the Syrian conflict envisioned in Security Council Resolution 2254 and applauds Special Envoy Gair Peterson, uh, whose efforts to reconvene the ninth round of the Syrian-led Constitutional Committee in April in Geneva are uh, being attempted right now. And we note that Geneva is the same location where all the previous rounds have taken place. Uh, and we know he was just there in uh, uh, Damascus within the last day trying to push forward on this um, effort. And we, we remain engaged with the UN and with our international partners to encourage advancement of the political track and the resolution. Uh, and we'll continue uh, to elevate uh, diverse Syrian voices and lead efforts at the UN to condemn, document, investigate, and call on actors to end abuses. 
So ensuring the enduring defeat of ISIS and al-Qaeda remains a top priority. Violent extremism poses a danger to Syrians and also throughout the region and the world. The US and our partners in the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS continue to work with our capable local partners to maintain constant pressure on ISIS remnants in Syria and Iraq to ensure the group's lasting defeat. Uh, so we know the challenges that face us remain immense. Our resolve to face them is even greater and uh, repeat and assure you what Ambassador Leaf assured you, which is the United States remains dedicated to resolving the Syrian crisis and to easing the suffering of Syrians. So I'm hopeful the multilateral Syria uh, strategy project can now help us forge a constructive path forward and unite experts and policymakers to strategize and challenge the status quo all the while striving for a goal we all share, a brighter future for Syria and its people. Uh, so thanks for the invitation to speak today and to answer more questions. Ambassador Kermy. Thank you very much, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, let me first thank our friends for, from the Middle East Institute, the Atlantic Council, and the European Institute of Peace, and Madania for organizing this important event. I'm very glad to be with you in DC today at quite a special time for Syria. For Syria, it is of course the very sad 13th anniversary of the revolution with little hope for the brighter future that millions of Syrians still strive for. And it's really timely to give you a quick overview of France's position on the crisis in Syria. 13 years into the war, one could legitimately argue that this, this is time for a policy shift. Assad is still in power. The political process has reached a dead end. So many people or countries today are pushing for a realistic shift called normalization on the base that we, win, we would need to deal with the fact that Assad is here to stay and that we need to acknowledge that the war is over. France is indeed in favor of a policy shift, but instead of normalization, we call for renewed international engagement on Syria based on resolution 2254. This is the only way forward, and I will tell you why. First, normalization without condition cannot be an option for two very strong reasons. We cannot forget the mass atrocities committed in Syria. All the principles and values that we struggle to promote today at the international level will crumble if we turn the, pad, the page on what happened and what is still happening in Syria today. Where the, stat, the state of barbar barbarism, as the French researcher Michel Seurat called it, reached a quite unprecedented level if we compare with our situation. Two, even if we put aside our principles and think in a so called realistic way, we have everything to lose and nothing to gain from normalizing without concession from the regime. France tried several times before the conflict to mend fence with Damascus and failed. More recently, regional actors tried and failed. We need to understand Assad's mindset, which explains why it remains the best enemy for normalization. Bashar thinks he owns Syria. So to him, making even the slightest concession means undermining the very essence and legitimacy of his power. That's why any engagement with the regime not based on concrete and verifiable steps is doomed to fail. We will lose a tremendous amount of credit and reputation. Assad will take the international recognition lifting of sanction and reconstruction money to tighten even more its grip on power, situation on the ground, 
would not change at all, and we will get nothing on counter-terrorism, refugees, Captagon, and so on. Not to mention, obviously, the political process or human rights. So normalization without condition is not an option, but just looking at the so-called status quo is also very dangerous. Everyone in the room knows perfectly well the reality of the situation of the, on the ground. The war is far from being over. The, in the past months alone, we have witnessed an unprecedented escalation literally everywhere in the country, Idlib, the North Seas, the, the Golan, the Rezor, Suaida. The fight against Daesh is not over. Everything is set for a resurgence of ISIS, especially if the coalition leaves northeast Syria. In the meantime, the Syrians inside are facing the worst humanitarian crisis, and the refugees outside still can't return to their country. With this dark picture in mind, what can the international community do? We all know that there is one way, only one way to bring peace and stability in Syria a political solution based on Resolution 2254. October 7 was just the last reminder, a most terrible one, of what happens when you forget to address the deep roots of a conflict. Easy to say, of course, but how we can achieve that? We think that where the Syria strategic project comes at the perfect time because despite the growing fatigue on this file and despite their differences, all regional and international actors share the same interest in resolving the Syria crisis and preventing further destabilization inside and outside the country. If we fail to find a solution, we will once again pay the consequences sooner or later. So we must do better collectively to defend our own interests and to answer the legitimate aspiration of the Syrian people. Let me finish by a ray of hope, one of the only ones when talking about Syria, the Syrians. Whenever they are given a chance, they do wonders, and Madalia is a living proof of that. We need to associate all Syrians from all the Syrian regions, in addition to refugees and diaspora outside the country. We, relying on them is, in my view, one of the keys if we want this country to thrive again. Thank you. Special Envoy. Yeah, thanks. thank you very much, first of all, for making it possible to uh, join the, the discussion. Um, I'm very much looking forward. It's a, it's a good moment to have a deep dive, a strategic look into, into uh, the Syria file. And um, I must say, I couldn't agree more to what uh, Ethan and um, Brigitte uh, just said. Um, uh, uh, of course, um, let me repeat, um, the three no's also for Germany is still valid. And I would like to explain to you why you asked, is it time for a policy change? And I would say it's time for a policy change um, in Damascus, right? Um, uh, we have the feeling that it all looks very, well, it is very dire the situation which uh, the, the, the reports and if you look into the country um, and the line um, but um, it is not that uh, I would stay um, without any hope as it might look uh, as uh, the regime is not that strong as it uh, pretends to be and uh, I mean uh, we see it in Suweda we see it also in the Alawite um, areas and um, there is no support uh, for the regime so I think um, uh, there's no reason to give up, right? And uh, I think if we would give up, we would make a huge mistake, uh, as we have seen it uh, with, uh, with different partners uh, before. As we know, the solution has to be political. Everything uh, uh, which is not political is only dealing with the symptoms. Even if I agree, we have to deal with the symptoms. And of course, we have to do more um, to alleviate the suffering, but we shouldn't, let's say, prolong um, the conflict and give up the, uh, 
the, 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 the perspective of a real solution out of fear, um, out of, um, of, of, of the, the, the idea that, 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 that we could fix the problem with um, dealing with the symptoms. And um, I would like to also add that uh, it's not only the regime which is um, weak, but it's also something to do with the construction, why it's still there. We all know that without Iran and Russia, um, the regime would not be there. And, uh, but I think if I, in, uh, if I would be in the, we call it the shoes of the regime, I would not be so sure that this, uh, this support will, 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 will be forever. And um, so I think we have to be prepared for two scenarios. The first scenario is, of course, of a protracted conflict where we have to do better, where we have to get resources, where we have to try to, to link the knots and coordinate well. But we also have to uh, prepare ourselves, this is the second scenario, for a very quick change, um, the so-called black swan. And uh, we shouldn't uh, miss this opportunity by now changing uh, uh, the policy uh, on the small scale. Um, we, have to, we have to fix the problem uh, politically. And um, I would also like to, um, uh, to echo what uh, Brigitte just said. There's also some reason for hope. Um, and also Mr. Asfari mentioned it. Um, the civil society, the political, I think, political, well, you could call it education, um, uh, 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 the progress uh, done, I think, in, in this area gives hope that the people are ready. Madania is a very good, um, uh, a very good example, but I would also like to add that we see it in Germany, the one million Syrians who are here, they, they learn something and, and, and they are ready to to take over responsibility and there might be sooner or later this moment for taking over responsible so there's no reason to give up i would like to say and uh, therefore i would like to underline that it's a good moment to think about strategically um, how we should move on in the next uh, short term um, um, period and also of course in the long term period thank you very much Thanks to the three of you for your opening remarks. Um, I'll have a few questions before we get to the audience Q&A, and feel free to jump in and answer them in whatever order you like. Um, your countries have stood firm against normalization of something that was alluded to in your opening remarks. But if diplomatic recognition of Assad is off the table for the foreseeable future, what about a more transactional approach? This was something, Ambassador Kermi, that, that you, uh, I think, hinted at in your opening remarks, the so-called step-by-step initiative. Um, would you support or could you envision a scenario in which there is limited engagement with the Syrian government based on verifiable and concrete steps that, if implemented, your countries could match with um, sanctions relief and assistance? Uh, so I guess I'll start. Um, I, from our perspective, uh, we've um, spoken at great length with uh, the UN Special Envoy and his office about step-by-step -step or step-for-step -step approaches. Uh, we know that the uh, Jordanian government had been interested in step-for-step -step approaches. Um, for us, uh, I think um, it's clear like what kinds of steps need to be taken for there to be a response on our sanctions, our laws, and uh, uh, the um, executive orders that lay out our sanctions very clear on you know, what the regime needs to do for there to be changes. Uh, but they're designed uh, to be flexible, so when there is change on their uh, part, uh, the um, uh, we can acknowledge, uh, and there can be uh, much smaller steps also if, if the regime were to be taking actions that indicated a clear change in how it's uh, treating its own people um, and how it's uh, dealing with the interact uh, international community. There, there can always be you know, different ways that we can uh, react to it, um, but you know, we also uh, see that there are many different countries that have engaged with the regime or not engaged with the regime. Uh, I think uh, uh, the UN has a role, the, the countries that have chosen to engage or engage. 
Um, it, and they can also make clear you know, to the regime why it is that our sanctions are there and, and what it is that it could start doing if it, if it was looking for change. Go ahead. <laughs> I think uh, the step-for-step -step, uh, approach is here since years now, and it shows that if something is to change, we need to, to have some very viable and irreversible steps on behalf of the regime. Uh, our, uh, our position is not uh, uh, ideologic. It's about uh, getting something by our leverage and uh, to let the, the, the regime move and, and shows that there is some change on the ground. So this is the, the whole strategy. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't work till now, uh, but it's not a reason to give up because uh, uh, the only way to resolve the crisis is diplomatic uh, and it's the political uh, solution. So this is one. Second, we have to take the lessons of uh, all the rapprochement and normalization we, we saw in the region. Uh, till now, if I'm not mistaken, there is no results. On the contrary, sometimes the situation is worse. So that's why we have to find some balance between uh, asking for something and be able to uh, see real and concrete steps uh, uh, before moving. Uh, I want to add something on sanction. Uh, sanction is one of our, our leverage tools. It, it prevents Assad from gaining the spoils of war and it prevents uh, uh, him to have a normalization and reconstruction money without any move. But uh, all the experts today uh, the regime uh, is saying that sanction is the cause of the problem. It's, the, it's not the cause. Uh, this is a man-made catastrophe. And all the experts agree to, uh, that if tomorrow all the sanctions are lifted, almost nothing will change on the ground. We saw this during, after the earthquake. We did uh, all of us, I think, exemption and it didn't change that much on the ground. So there is unfortunately not much we can do against, uh, we can do on sanction, but we have to be better uh, for the Syrian people, people on the side effect of the sanction, I mean uh, over compliance and, and the risking. But we need to keep this tool in mind and on the table. Uh, the idea is we are ready to, to make steps, but we have, first of all, to, to see concrete results. Till now, there is nothing of, on, of this sort in, on the table. Special Envoy. Yeah, uh, the same here in Berlin. I mean, um, a more transactional than the step for step is not possible. There are very concrete proposals, and uh, Mr. Patterson. Special Envoy Patterson has tried now for months and years a very, very concrete to get into a meaningful dialogue. For the time being, um, there has been no reaction because I think uh, the regime feels emboldened by some moves um, uh, for, from other partners and uh, because also, of course, they are not, not used to it. It's not in their DNA, as you would say it. But um, the step for step is still on the table. Um, uh, Germany as partners are ready to contribute and uh, we still call on the regime uh, to, to take this opportunity to do something for its own people and to move in, a, in, a, in the right direction. As I said, um, they need it also. Uh, they are not in such a strong situation as they pretend to be. Uh, as they pretend to be. You mentioned uh, the UN Special Envoy's efforts. Um, he said over the weekend that there is no political solution in sight for Syria as of this month. It's been two years since the last meeting of the Constitutional Committee. Is it time to admit that the political process as we know it under 2254 is not working? Is Or if it can be salvaged, what ideas do you have to get the Syrian government to participate in good faith? Sure, again. Um, so I think you know the main reason it's not working uh, is because the uh, regime in Damascus chooses not to participate 
uh, in a political process. It's not clear to me that there's anything particularly wrong with uh, the uh, Constitutional Committee or uh, any of the other avenues into a political process. It's a um, question of motivation on the part of uh, the regime to uh, actually uh, decide to participate. Um, so uh, the uh, effort right now to start the Constitutional Committee, I think, is, is uh, a worthwhile effort. Uh, a concern that beyond the regime, there's another actor that has prevented the Constitutional Committee from meeting uh, for um, you know, closing in on two years now, uh, which is Russia, um, which for its own reasons chose to stop going to meetings in uh, Geneva. Uh, it was not. Uh, a perfect process, but it was functioning. Uh, it, we were looking for ways to uh, deliver uh, more from the sessions of the Constitutional Committee, and we were uh, pressing for there to be actual results coming out of the sessions, but the fact that the sessions completely stopped uh, in uh, the uh, summer of 2022, um, was um, uh, a decision you know, that, uh, that started with Russia and then uh, went to the regime. Um, so I would say uh, that um, we do need to keep looking back at uh, the regime, which has been the obstacle from many different angles to all the different ways that people have attempted to start, restart a political process, start a process toward a, um, end to the crisis, and, uh, and, and so far we're not there. Yes, I agree with, with all the remarks of uh, my friend uh, Ethan. Uh, we have to, uh, the, 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 blockage, the blockage of our efforts is not uh, on our side. The regime and Russia will keep in blocking these efforts. This is not the reason, the reason why we must give up. Uh, we have to uh, look at real steps, as I said, uh, not cosmetics, uh, just to please uh, the, 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 uh, the international community, such as amnesty decrees, the dismissal of military tribunals, the engagement on refugees return, and so on, and the hypothetic resume of the Constitutional Committee. I think the, 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 the big effort we have to do is to uh, continue the, uh, to push for this uh, political solution, and at the same time, bring the Syrian voices back, because this is uh, missing for the moment. Uh, not because the Syrians' voices don't want to, to participate, on the contrary, but everything is, is done to block these uh, voices. So we have to, to put a special effort on, on finding the place for this voice to be uh, heard. And in, in the absence of a broad political settlement, we need to close the gap between all the Syrians outside, inside Syria, between the Northwest and the Northeast, not forgetting those living in the regime area. So uh, one way of uh, preparing the ground and reinforce uh, our wish for a political process is to work at every possible local level, being inside or outside Syria, and to empower those Syrians in their daily struggle, not to forget uh, all the official uh, platform uh, of the, those Syrian voice, including the opposition. Again, I'm so sorry. I, I just can't agree with, with what I said. Um, I mean, 2254 is a good resolution. There's a lot in it. And um, it's not the fault of the resolution that, uh, that the regime is uh, not moving on it. Um, there are uh, step for step, like confidence building measures is in there. And a political process, uh, as we all agree, is needed, is enshrined there. So um, sometimes out of frustration, I hear uh, voices saying 2254 is dead. We have to think about something new. No, it's not about the form, it's not about the resolution, it's about the actors and I think the substance and the readiness to get into a meaningful discussion where the lack of, um, where the lack is. Thank you. 
Uh, just a reminder to those watching, um, you can submit your questions at askac.org. Um, I want to discuss sanctions, which you, you referenced um, just a short minute ago. Um, the U.S. and Europe maintain heavy sanctions on the Syrian government. There's a bill working its way through Congress that would expand those sanctions. Um, what are the policy objectives of sanctions today? And, and what do you say to this argument that, Ambassador Kermy, you, you referenced that um, Western sanctions aren't having their intended effect, that they're um, actually bringing economic hardship to the civilian population while failing to secure concessions from the regime? I'll get your uh, American and, and German colleagues to weigh in on that. Or you can comment as well, of course. I didn't say they are the reason for the economic, uh, on the contrary. Oh, but the <laughs> argument, I mean, it's often No, no, reference. it's yeah. uh, the sanctions are not the cause of the problem. We have only to, to work on the side effects, but they still are really necessary because uh, we need leverage to to change the behavior of this regime, which will, which will never change anything uh, without pressure. So we care for the Syrian people. I don't think the regime care for its own population. And sanctions are not a tool to punish the, the Syrian people on the contrary, just to limit the, the, the bad effects of, of the regime on their own population and, and uh, to constrain and, and push for their change of behavior. Um, so I, I would add, you know, our sanctions are designed to put pressure on the regime and the people surrounding the regime that are benefiting from uh, the regime being in power, the, the regime cronies. Um, they're designed uh, not to uh, affect humanitarian assistance flow. Um, we've taken steps uh, to try to make sure that if uh, they're inadvertently doing that, uh, to remedy that. Um, and uh, we uh, even went to the extent after the earthquake of I issuing a general license for six months uh, to um, make sure uh, that uh, it was uh, crystal clear that people could send in the assistance that they were trying to send in at that time. Uh, and uh, when the circumstances uh, for the general license were no longer needed, we still are looking you know, at uh, whenever there are over compliance situations or situations where uh, people are not understanding uh, what the sanctions uh, require or don't require that the information is available uh, to them. So, um, so the tool itself is an important tool. It, it, it uh, pushes, it puts pressure uh, on the regime. Uh, if it uh, wasn't an effective tool, we wouldn't hear so much uh, from the regime about our sanctions, I think. Um, but uh, you know, as, as Brigitte said, uh, they're not designed to hurt the Syrian people, uh, and the economic problems in the country are stemming largely from the regime's corruption and the regime's uh, misgovernment of the country. Uh, and uh, so, um, so that's why we, we have uh, sanctions in place. Again, not a lot to add. I mean, it's the behavioral change. That's the policy goal. And um, I think there's nothing wrong with um, sanctioning um, Captagon, um, people involved in Captagon production in gross human rights violations. And um, I mean, the other uh, uh, sanctions, they're really putting pressure on the regime. And as Ethan pointed out, um, it seems to work in a way as the regime always points uh, uh, to, 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 to the sanctions as uh, one of the, uh, their major um, uh, points which they would like to see. So I think as a policy um, instrument, it is uh, good. It should uh, change uh, uh, their behavior. And um, on the other hand, uh, the unwanted side effects needs hard work from our side. And uh, we are ready, as we showed a year ago, in changing, uh, making some adaptions. And we're working on, um, on focusing it uh, even more. Those are targeted sections I would like to underline. Despite the conflict lines being largely frozen, the humanitarian aid picture remains bleak. 16.7 million people across Syria are in need of assistance, according to the UN, at a time when donor budgets are stretched thin. It seems to me that one of the challenges in moving Syrians away from uh, aid dependence is doing so without legitimizing the Syrian government that has a long history of manipulating and diverting aid. Um, 
if full scale reconstruction um, is off the table, what is your view uh, as far as moving beyond the emergency response? Should there be, for example, more emphasis on um, early recovery projects that restore basic services, um, especially in the Northwest? Um, so I, I can start by also uh, reminding everyone that uh, we had the general license number 22, uh, which was designed for the uh, non-regime areas that had been liberated from ISIS. So uh, that was a tool that we saw as uh, being able to bring investment into the, uh, those areas and offer an alternative uh, to uh, the um, stabilization assistance that uh, we have been uh, providing, but um, to uh, graduate those areas to uh, other forms of uh, uh, income that could be uh, coming in. So, um, you know, the basic premise of your question, I think, uh, is, is important that the humanitarian situation uh, remains dire uh, in the country. Um, and, you know, our country, uh, I think, uh, throughout the duration of the crisis has been the top donor. Uh, for Syria, something like $17 billion since uh, uh, 2013, and um, uh, uh, maybe a billion dollars in the, in the past year, including with the earthquake. Um, it, so looking for uh, ways um, uh, where the international community uh, can sustain uh, the assistance that it is able uh, to provide are important in the non-regime areas. I think we're uh, able to do that um, by uh, uh, through this uh, general license and uh, looking at uh, other um, uh, areas um, uh, that could benefit from that. Um, and in the uh, regime areas, um, we, uh, you know, early recovery has a specific definition, a specific pur purpose, and I think we've tried to lean forward in using uh, early recovery for its uh, correct uh, purposes, um, but it's not designed for reconstruction or, or for development. Um, so, you know, to get to those points in the regime areas, I think we do have to reach uh, the point where uh, the um, regime behavior uh, uh, has changed significantly. So, uh, uh, so that, that kind of um, uh, assistance is, is um, uh, allowed, and we're not near there right now. So, um, <laughs> perhaps a slight difference here. Um, first of all, I, I just want to remind that uh, our uh, aid for Syria stayed remarkably uh, stable. Uh, we we have a fixed budget annually for Syria, and till now, it's the third one of our crisis center for all the world. So for a protected, protracted crisis of 13 years, having this budget uh, just sanctuarized is already a significant uh, way of uh, uh, showing that our interest for Syria and for the Syrian people is still there. Uh, and we will continue to do so. We are working uh, at, uh, for, uh, on Syria, uh, inside Syria, in all the areas, and of course, uh, supporting the hosting countries and doing things as well for uh, the Syrian in diaspora in our country. Uh, inside Syria, we have different strategy uh, we, to, to, to deal with the constraints, but we do work on early recovery project in all the areas. This is the slight difference. What is important for us is to reach the beneficiaries the most direct way possible. So that's why we don't at all, for example, in the regime area deal with the regime, of course, but also with uh, institutions related to the regime. So we, we know our beneficiaries since before the conflict. And uh, this is the, this good knowledge of the landscape which help us to, to, to reach the beneficiaries. And we have very strict due diligence to be sure that at the end of the day, this is the Syrian people benefiting. Uh, in, in other areas, we, we do a lot of efforts, uh, humanitarian early recovery, and in the Northeast, we do as well some stabilization project. 
So uh, all in all, uh, we will continue to to uh, to keep uh, the pass and the, the, the amount of our aid because we believe the Syrians don't have to pay twice for the catastrophe. Yeah, on the early recovery discussion, I would like to underline also that we are doing it for years uh, because we need sustainable solutions. Um, as I said before, we have to prepare for a longer period um, of the crisis, but without having bad effects on, 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 a, on a political, a possible political uh, solution. This is the fine line we have to walk. Uh, and, and therefore, it's not so much about uh, what we do um, politically, but how we do it. And um, um, as uh, Brigitte uh, pointed out, um, uh, uh, there are ways uh, uh, to, to avoid unintended uh, political um, effects. Uh, for example, um, I, I, I like this um, uh, example very much. Electricity is not a no-go, but it depends on how you do it. When you're making small solar panels, and we do it for years now, and you do it locally, then you avoid any wrong signaling to the regime and you don't empower it. So it is more about how you do it uh, than what you do it. And of course, we have to look for sustainable solutions um, and we cannot um, continue um, uh, uh, relying only on humanitarian aid. But this is a process which is now going on already for years. So I think we have to uh, do a lot of mo more of uh, early recovery and we have to do it in a smart way. I'm going to squeeze in one more question before pulling up the questions from our audience. Um, back to this idea of normalization, um, I want to get your take on this trend that we saw accelerated um, in the aftermath of the earthquakes and uh, culminating with um, Syria's re-entry into the Arab League. Um, do you think that these countries that have normalized, have they gained anything from their engagement with the regime? And I'm also curious, what are your conversations like with your Arab, Arab partners who have chosen this approach? Are you actively encouraging them not to normalize? Um, so uh, I think um, there was a lot of uh, uh, activity around the time of a Arab League summit last year, uh, culminating in the uh, re-entry of uh, Syria into the Arab League, the, the reactivation. Uh, you know, we uh, certainly did not uh, support uh, what the uh, Arab Leagues had, had decided to do at that moment. Um, after that, uh, we um, did uh, stay in touch with the countries, especially the countries that we had uh, talked to about Syria for a long time. And uh, we looked at the kinds of statements that were issued just before uh, the uh, Arab summit and at the summit and, and just afterward, at what was on their agenda. And many other things on their agenda were the same kinds of things that we had been working uh, toward uh, from the uh, uh, international perspective, um, and so um, we were interested, you know, if they had made this decision and they were going to engage to see if maybe they would make uh, some progress on, on the um, issues that were uh, of concern to them. Um, uh, uh, so far, it looks like they haven't made much progress at all. It looks like they faced a lot of frustration uh, even before the October uh, crisis uh, pulled the uh, attention of the region in other directions. Um, I think uh, they were already facing uh, disappointment. Um, you know, to us, uh, if they were able to move forward the uh, international agenda on Syria through uh, those engagements, um, they would uh, have uh, value, even if you know, we don't uh, wouldn't agree with the. Uh, process uh, in which they ended up there. Um, but at, at the moment, I think uh, they're experiencing the same frustration everyone else who has tried to deal with the regime experiences, uh, that uh, the, the regime seems to just play for time instead of actually engaging and trying to solve problems. I think um, before the decision, uh, we didn't tell our, our friends uh, to not to do normalization, but we, because we are not in the position of dictating what they have to do or not to do. But we told them, uh, we think that it will not bring results because uh, 
moving towards Damascus without condition is not bringing results. And we can understand that the, there was some frustration and they want to try something else. They are the neighbors and uh, they, they, they want the Arab role to, to, be, to be back in Syria. But we, we, t we told them, we think that it's not a move which will bring results. So we, we were discussing a lot and uh, we, we, were, we were not hiding our doubts about the démarche. And very soon we, we saw the result. But as Ethan uh, uh, just mentioned, it's very interesting to, to see the last uh, the last uh, statement issued at the Cairo meeting in, uh, in August uh, 23, because if you compare this statement with the 2254, it's almost the same. So uh, the move was, uh, 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 they were hoping that the move in itself would be sufficient. And at the end of the day, they, are, they, they, they have had the same uh, asks as we are asking the Syrian regime. So. We have to continue to dialogue with them. We always did before the, the, the summit. We will continue. I think the more we consult with everybody and uh, the more, especially the, the neighboring countries, the best is to, to, to try to, to find the solution for Syria. In other words, if we are united together to push the, the regime to, to move, and to change, it will be for the benefit of the Syrians. Yeah, indeed, we, we, we did not want to, to interfere um, in this decision, but we made clear that we were skeptical. And at the same time, I think one, um, one thing where we, we can move, where we did move, is um, we understand, of course, the concerns, um, especially of neighboring countries concerning Again, for example, Cap Dagon. And um, you will not uh, solve this problem with the, with, the, with the Syrian side, which is responsible for, for this problem. But we made some offers to see if we can together fight the problem or give some, um, some new um, uh, possibilities for the countries to deal with it and to deal also with the effects on their society. And I think uh, that's the right way to do um, between partners. And uh, we will continue in this pace. All right, let's take a few audience questions. Um, I'm going to group some together so that we can get as many in as possible. Um, the first two for uh, the three of you, donors are giving less to the Syrian response. What tangible steps are donors taking to follow through on their commitments to improve the capacity of local Syrian organizations to fill the gap? And the second question, 13 years on, do you think Northeast Syria's SDC, the Syrian Democratic Council, deserves to be on the official negotiation table? Do you think their participation would change the calculations of the regime? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with That'd be great. the second one. Though. Um, so uh, we've um, thought uh, that all the people in Syria need to be uh, represented um, in uh, political processes. So that to the extent that we can bring people from northeast Syria into uh, the discussion, um, it, we think uh, that that would be important and, and a step forward uh, to have um, voices uh, from th that region, uh, uh, from the various um, uh, political movements in that region uh, um, uh, speaking uh, what, when people are considering the structure of, of the future of, of Syria. Um, and then uh, on the uh, first uh, part of the question, you know, we work with a number of uh, different uh, organizations um, uh, who uh, receive uh, grants and partner with us on uh, stabilization and uh, the non-regime uh, parts of Syria, um, and we're working um, uh, within the resources that are available to us, uh, uh, working through uh, the different programs that we have with them. Um, and I think you know we all have to acknowledge that we're at a moment where there are multiple uh, international crises going on and finite resources uh, for uh, donor governments. So we're trying to 
make sure that we're using our uh, assistance most effectively uh, and uh, Syria will remain a significant recipient. Uh, uh, our, um, the uh, Syrian people will remain a significant recipient of our uh, humanitarian assistance and, and our uh, stabilization uh, assistance, um, and we'll just make sure that uh, we're using it in the most effective way possible. On the second question, to, to follow the path of Ethan, uh, um, I mentioned in my introduction that we support every effort when the Syrians are coming together to be stronger uh, in the negotiation, at the negotiation table with Assad. So there is no reason to exclude people from the Northeast, north as there is no reason to, to exclude people from any part inside Syria or outside Syria. Uh, the, the idea is uh, those who want to, to commit to, to, to fight for to the uh, integrity of uh, Syrian territories and so on, um, uh, we, are, we must push them to be at the table. For that, and uh, I'm, I think the Syrians have to, to strengthen their, their ranks uh, themselves as well for us to be able to help them. This, the move must come also from the Syrians because if they, they are uh, able to, 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 to be together, uh, they will be stronger and we can help them uh, better. Uh, on the first question, uh, we maintain our aid uh, for Syria. Uh, this is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, a, a signal that we are very much attached to a political solution uh, for Syria. I hope it will stay like this because uh, crises are multiplying and uh, uh, we, we are trying to sanctuarize the level of, of our aid, but we have to do better for the Syrians to be able to have a, a livelihood means first and to, uh, to, to, to be sustainable in their daily life as well. So perhaps this is an effort we can concentrate on. Yeah, similar uh, here in Berlin. Um, we will see. We have um, um, spent every year more than one billion for Syria. We will see if it will be this time again. It looks not good that it will be this time, but uh, uh, it reminds us um, that we have to do something on on, on the um, sustainability of our projects, uh, of course. And on the second one. Um, yes, the SNC is um, uh, the, the partner uh, for negotiations, and it is, it is up to the Syrians um, to put together the SNC. Um, uh, Ayman just mentioned at the beginning the agency of Syrians, and um, we are not those who intervene into those decisions, even if we have sometimes some predilection or maybe some reservations, but. Um, this is democracy, and uh, I very much uh, cherish agency of the Syrians. Okay, I've got two more for you. Uh, you've mentioned a step-by-step -step process for the regime. Has there been any serious consideration for a similar step-by-step -step process for sanctioned opposition groups in northwest Syria that could see increased humanitarian aid and engagement in exchange for concrete behavior change? And one more, are there any conditions that would persuade you to end the Geneva process? If so, what conditions? Have your governments considered alternatives to D Geneva? If so, what might these look like? Um, so uh, on the first question, um, I think, uh, you know, our uh, de uh, designation of uh, uh, terrorist organizations, you know, it, it's pretty clear what's uh, it, what's in our law, how uh, organization became uh, designated, and uh, what what it would have to do to change. So I don't know that the the um, step for step formula is in a different context with uh, you know the the UN the regime and others. Um, but I think you know anyone who's looking to change their behavior uh, and um, uh, um, remove themselves from uh, c consideration, um, you know, should look at uh, our, our laws and how, how, um, 
how you go about uh, um, complying and, and changing uh, how your organization uh, is, is behaving. And, um, and then, uh, the, remind me of the second question. Uh, the Geneva process, what conditions um, would lead you to abandon it? Uh, yeah, so I think we touched a, a few times already in the discussion on, you know, there's nothing particularly wrong with 2254 or any of the political processes or, um, so I don't think it's a question of abandoning the Geneva process or abandoning the resolution or whatever. I think what we're looking for right now is some significant change in the approach of uh, the regime, some some engagement. Um, uh, you know, if, if it was clear that uh, they were embarking on some kind of different path, um, you know, they, uh, uh, we could look at um, you know how you respond, uh, but if there's no change and there's never any change, um, it doesn't make sense to abandon uh, an existing mechanism that was built uh, to allow uh, the um, uh, various uh, parties to, to the conflict to work through and um, uh, resolve the crisis. Um. I don't think the step-for-step -step approach applied to uh, to uh, terrorist organization who, who who knows why they are on the list and what it takes to to be put off the list. Uh, that's as simply of, uh, as that. Uh, on the Geneva process, uh, to leave the Geneva process is not a solution. On the contrary, we have to come back to the Geneva process, and that's. What uh, we discussed from the beginning of this conversation, uh, it's not because it's not working, uh, because, uh, the, the, because of the, the, the stubborn attitude of the regime that we don't have to try again. We have to come back to the Geneva process and to find uh, other ways of uh, strengthening our tools together. And on this point, unity of all the countries concerned but by what happened what is happening in Syria must perhaps make more effort to present a, a united front at, and to to show that they, they are still concerned uh, about the Syria crisis in other words uh, Syria has to be uh, has, has to stay uh, on the international agenda, and we have to take any occasion, even if uh, the, the, the world is, is very busy with our crisis, just to remind that this is not a frozen conflict, and it will definitely be worse if we just let it go as it is. I agree that uh, step for step process, of course, is uh, linked to the UN um, and, and, and to the process of Gerd Pedersen uh, with, a, with a regime. Um, but uh, what I would say for the whole of Syria and for all actors, that all decisions they're making have an effect on the decisions we are making. Um, the more um, difficult it is to help on the ground, the more interference there is, the more aid diversion, the less aid would come also. So uh, every decision also on legislation, on participation of um, women, of minorities, whatever, uh, will have an effect. Um, and uh, therefore, um, every party in the whole of Syria um, should uh, think twice about their, 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 um, uh, their decisions. Uh, on, on the second one, I just can agree uh, that it's not the Geneva process that the problem um, we have pointed out before. It's about the regime in not uh, getting involved. And the excuses are um, not uh, very convincing, which we heard before. So I think it's not um, the, the format which is the problem, but it is about the willingness, um, unfortunately. And I would like to repeat the call um, to the regime uh, to use this chance of a Geneva process and the step-for-step uh, step, um, to use it. OK, 
Okay, I think we are about out of time, unfortunately. Um, I want to thank our panelists for this engaging discussion. And of course, thank you to our audience for submitting questions. Um, we will now have a short coffee break for about 10 minutes, and then we'll see you back here for the next panel. Thank you so much.
I'm Mona Yakubian. I'm the Vice President for the Middle East and North Africa at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this panel. We're going to be broadening the aperture a bit and looking at 13 years of conflict, a regional and international perspective. One of the themes we've heard, and I think one of the paradoxes of where we are today, is that Syria is receiving less and less attention in policy circles, and yet it is in many ways more central than ever to many of the themes and trends that we're seeing, not just in the region, but globally. So I'm thrilled to welcome a very distinguished panel of experts and, frankly, friends and colleagues who are going to help us unpack some of these complex trends and understand better how they're resonating in Syria, how Syria in many ways is emblematic of a number of regional and global trends. Natasha Hall is a senior fellow with the Middle East Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Vali Nasser is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Southeast Asia, South Asia Center and the Majid Kadouri Professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the School of Advanced and International Affairs of, of Johns Hopkins. Brian Katoulis, who is joining us virtually, is a senior fellow for US foreign policy and a senior advisor to the president of the Middle East Institute. So as we expand and broaden the aperture on today's discussion, Natasha, I want to start with you. And I'd like you to sort of first tell us a little bit more. I don't think you need to inform the people in this room, but why does Syria still matter? What should we be understanding from internal dynamics and regime behavior in particular in terms of how that may resonate, not just regionally, but even globally? Right, it's a big question. Um, I struggle sometimes to answer, I think, the first part of the question, because I do wonder how many times Syria has to prove to us that it matters for us to get it. Um, but I digress. Um, I mean, I think Syria is important. It's an important country because of its location and because of its history. It is at the, the doorstep of Europe and Africa. It's at the heart of the Middle East. Um, and now that crossroads of civilizations is a festering wound. And I think if we've learned anything from the past five months, uh, we've learned that those wounds without care can go septic at any time. And this is particularly true in this region because there are so many actors that actually benefit from these crises spilling over. And that includes the Syrian regime and its, and its allies. Um, I mean, from the humanitarian crisis to the refugee crisis to ISIS, uh, to Captagon now, it's become fairly clear that things in Syria can always get worse and that those things rarely stay in Syria. Um, and we also have a leader in Assad who has learned to create problems and then portray himself as the only one that can solve those problems. And that is particularly problematic, I think, for us for US policymakers and, and for those in Europe and the region as well. And I'll just give you a few examples of the sort of regional reverberations. Today, uh, Assad is the linchpin for humanitarian aid access after besieging millions of his own people for many years. He controls essentially humanitarian aid access, not just in the areas that he does control, but even areas that he does not control, and can essentially withdraw that access at any time for four million people in northwest Syria today. And that effectively makes him essential to negotiations. And it also weakens, I think, any international response to his behavior as well. Another lever he holds is refugees. Uh, we know that the Syrian regime is responsible for forcibly displacing millions of people. And effectively changing, I think, the narrative on the conflict itself in doing so. Uh, th those in Europe, regional host countries, suddenly change the narrative around the conflict to one of crisis management rather than one of dealing with Bashar al-Assad himself. And so today we see a lot of the negotiations around normalization um, and ne negotiations for, with the Assad regime itself revolving around the return of refugees, refugees that Assad has explicitly said on more than one occasion that he does not want back. 
Um, and just to quote him, you know, Syrian society is now more homogeneous uh, and healthier than before. I mean, let that sit for a moment. And yet still, we give him this sort of additional lever. Um, I think the regime has also sort of, uh, for a long time, benefited from the perpetuation of this idea or this false choice that it's between him and, and an ISIS or an Al-Qaeda group. Um, but we know that he has uh, released terrorists from prison to create mayhem in other countries even before the revolution started. Um, and so I do wonder when we start talking about withdrawal from northeast Syria, what that means for the thousands of prisoners, the ISIS fighters that remain in camps and prisons in that area as well and could potentially be another pawn. And then finally, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but the regime we know makes billions from Captagon, the Captagon industry. Uh, I was just on the Jordanian border a few months ago, and I can tell you that this is a significant problem for Jordan. I think it's less of a priority for the destination countries. It is a weak uh, you know, sort of drug. Um, but I could imagine a scenario where that drug becomes stronger, where other drugs are sort of thrown into the mix that are stronger, and suddenly that's another lever that the Assad regime has over the world. So, I mean, I'm just going to zoom out because this isn't just obviously about the Assad regime. There are many, many actors that can exploit this space. I think Vali will speak to Iran, so I won't get into that. Um, but just at the 10,000 foot level, um, I think that you see Syria and its allies adapting and learning as they go. Um, but everyone in the world sees this playbook, essentially, a, I would say, a successful playbook for survival. Um, and that's really a problem, because Assad's regime has essentially become an advertisement for the utility of shattering norms. Um, you see other governments, other leaders that have given up WMD, that have stepped aside, and they have been killed, or in the case of Mubarak, put in a literal cage. Um, and today you see Assad, who's used chemical weapons, who's besieged millions of people, uh, killed hundreds of thousands of others, and he's walking red carpets. So I don't think it should be surprising to anybody in this room or in the audience online that we are seeing this strategy being replicated over and over again throughout the world. Um, and I would say a big component of that success is finding a great power protector. Um, in this case, it's Russia. It won't always be Russia. Um, but just by, by virtue of having that protector, you have conflicts that become internationalized, fueled, protracted for longer and longer periods of time. Because there are so many actors that benefit from the fragility that it creates. Um, and unfortunately, I think the US response sort of continues to be one of sanctions and humanitarian aid. But we know that the power of sanctions is weakened the more we use them on different actors. And we know that humanitarian aid grows thinner as more crises emerge competing for those funds. So I'm, I'm really excited about this project um, because I think there is a way to treat this wound. I don't think there's a way to get rid of it altogether. Uh, but I do think that there are missed opportunities that we will potentially wish that we could rewind um, and, and hope that we had taken preventative care at some point in the future. So. Thank you. So Thank before you. turning to Vali, let me remind our audience both here and online, if you have questions, please submit them to askac.org because we very much want to bring you uh, into the conversation. So Vali, I'd like to turn to you next. And I, one of the things I think many of us have noted in the past is that Syria is notable as maybe one of the most complex arenas of geopolitical comp competition. There's no fewer than five foreign armies, foreign militaries operating there. And actually, with Jordan and its growing concerns over Captagon, I think we could argue there are now six foreign militaries operating one way or another inside Syria. Iran, of course, is, is foundational. Uh, the Assad family's ties to Iran goes back decades, uh, dating back to Hafez al-Assad and, and certainly with Bashar. Um, tell us, in your view as, a, as an analyst of, of Iran, how should we understand Iran's role in Syria today? And in particular, can you talk a bit, we, we would have to, I think it'd be odd not to mention Gaza and the, the conflict in Gaza, how those ripple effects mm -hmm 
are reverberating in Syria, particularly with respect to Iran and, and its proxies on the ground there. Well, first of all, so thanks to Atlantic Council and Middle East Institute for, um, for this event and for uh, inviting me. Um, I think just building on, on what Natasha said, uh, perhaps it was uh, uh, thinking about Syria the past two, three years. Uh, it's a lull before a storm because it's impossible to think of a country the size of Syria, of its ge geopolitical importance, of its historical significance, that it could continue to be a zone of conflict, albeit sometimes frozen conflict, and to have actually peace and stability in the region uh, around it. And uh, the longer Syria stays in the situation that it is, I think the more it will invite uh, um, you know, outside interference or, or others playing uh, their, uh, for their interest in Syria. And, and then when you have other events happening like the Gaza war, that it inevitably spills into, into Syria. Uh, now, you know, you could say, and this is connected to Iran, because Iran has become sort of a central player there. Uh, I mean, that's the way it happened. They, they went in very early to protect the Assad regime for reasons of their own. Those reasons have not really changed significantly, but they have essentially remained in a very important way within, within Syria. So I think they're integral to every conflict that is happening in Syria. But it also is, uh, is, is they're part of the other sets of conflicts that maybe not involve them at the same time. And also now that the entire Iranian regional strategy of this idea of an axis of resistance in a much broader sense, you know, runs through Syria and Syria is central to it. And I'll say that that means that Syria is likely to be playing a much, much bigger role in regional conflict right as soon as we, uh, you know, everybody gets uh, past what's happening in Gaza. I think you know, Syria would be next. So you know, we have a set of conflicts that are ongoing, that are interrelated. There's a, there's a, there has been an American-Turkish, uh, if you want to call it, standoff, uh, sometimes bordering on uh, much more conflictual, that even held hostage to some extent, you know, Sweden's membership in NATO, sale of F-16s, et cetera, to Turkey, the way Turkey's playing with, 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 with Russia, with the rest of the region. And it's all around the issue of where the line of uh, American presence and support for the Kurds in, in Syria is. And it does go to issues like who's going to control the ISIS fighters if, if the U.S. backs away or if the Kurds back, back away. That has had movement in it, uh, but, it but it's very much connected to what's ha what else is happening in Syria. I think a very important axis is, is the entire which, the way in which Iran and Hezbollah basically came to understand that, that uh, beyond just protecting Assad, Syria is an opportunity for creating a much stronger forward presence against Israel, of expanding the sort of border, uh, hostile border uh, around Israel beyond southern Lebanon into, into, into uh, Syria, build bases. And a major opportunity was, of course, when the Russians began to uh, reduce their footprint in uh, many bases in Latakia, et cetera, that Iran and Hezbollah stepped in. That escalated uh, the, the, the direct conflict between I Iran and Israel in Syria that, that uh, is still ongoing, you know, attacks on, on intelligence uh, units, on, on military units, et cetera. That hasn't gone away. And uh, it, it's going to find much greater importance for the U.S. and for Israelis going forward. If you look at what happened, uh, with who, what is happening with Houthis in the Red Sea, the idea of Iran and Hezbollah having bases in Latakia uh, on, on the Mediterranean, and in fact, the Iranians are now talking very openly about the strategic depth now extending uh, to the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Uh, so it sugge suggests to you that you know, there, there's a much bigger game at play now than just defending uh, uh, the Assad regime. Now, uh, to the, there is a very direct Iran-U.S. confrontation because uh, I think everybody understands the reason the U.S. is still in Syria is perhaps not about ISIS. It's not about Syria. It's about disrupting a land corridor between uh, Iran and, and Hezbollah going from Iraq through, uh, through uh, uh, Syria. And if you looked at the way in which Israel has been hitting uh, uh, and the U.S. has been hitting Iranian targets, it's usually to disrupt the, the, the sort of land route of supply, not only supplying Hezbollah, but, but help it, building the infrastructure that is being built around Israel. The Iranians have increasingly deployed Shia militias in Iraq in order to basically push back. And in fact, the, the, the killing of three American uh, um, 
servicemen that happened recently was exactly that of an attack by an Iraqi militia on an American base in Syria, a base whose job is actually is is not about ISIS, has been about uh, monitoring and, in, in, and interdicting uh, that land bridge in, into Syria. Now, every time the U.S. and uh, the United States had either we've seen escalation in recent times or an agreement that's been around uh, uh, Iranian and American attacks in Syria. So when they had an agreement in, in, in Oman before October 7th, a, a sort of an Iranian ceasefire in Syria was part of it. That, uh, uh, that Iran and the new militias that it's creating, which is different from the older militias, would not target the United States troops in Syria. That held until the Gaza war started. After Gaza, Iran used uh, Syria actually to escalate on the U.S., essentially, both in terms of uh, playing a role in the Gaza war, but also maybe sensing an opportunity that the Gaza war had not put the U.S.'s back to the wall. And if you push enough and hard enough, the U.S. may actually abandon this land bridge and leave Syria. And there is an expectation that that may work much more, in fact, when Trump comes in, or if Trump comes in, I may, I may, I may say, that, that, that <laughs> yes, I don't want to put uh, too much of a dour point on the afternoon, but uh, this, this already Syria is bad enough. But, but the, 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 point, the point being that, that uh, it, the door may be open, that with the right amount of pressure and threat, mm -hmm. the U.S. would go. So, so the game plan for Iran is right now to eject the United States from Syria for no reason than other than getting getting out of Iran's way as it's trying to build this land corridor. Although the U.S. leaving would actually make the Iran-Israel situation far, far more dangerous mm -hmm. uh, than it is, because at least the U.S. is sitting in the middle. Now, I think, you know, the Hezbollah or Iran, even if you listen carefully to the rhetoric, from the day that the October 7 attacks happened and Israel started its um, his campaign against Hamas in Gaza understood that the Gaza war will stop at some point, and then th there is a next step in this war. This war will not sta stop with a ceasefire or a two-state solution. You know that's only a solution to the phase one. That we're now in a much broader regional war. That Israel, as it's already saying, that it wants to go after Hezbollah in Lebanon, but then you know the one that nobody talks about is actually Syria. So what, what, is, what would be Israeli sense of security in terms of Syria? Would be the American sense of security? And how would Hezbollah and Iran fight against Israel in Syria? And so uh, um, in a way, you know, Syria, Syria is right in the middle of, of the Gaza war, although a part of it that we actually don't talk about at all. <laughs> it's, a, it's a battlefront about which we don't talk about. And so, yes, I think it's going to be very much there. And then finally, I would say, you know, Syria became at one point a, a, an arena of competition conflict between U.S. And, and Russia. And then Russia basically began to sort of disappear because of the war in Ukraine. Now, increasingly, the expectation is that as the war in Ukraine is winding down, the Russians want to come back. Mm -hmm. And they, they want basically their, their positions and bases, and it's creating certain friction between Iran and the Russians. And Assad is actually using this, uh, playing between Russia and, and Iran, because the Russians want some of those bases they gave up. They want this sort of prime position that they had in that alliance that, that they gave up. But at the same time, the Russians will come into Syria not only to claim stop material for them, but also to go after the U.S. in a way, mm -hmm. and after Western, Western interest. At some point, U.S. and Russia both being active in Syria in a much greater way uh, that we haven't since the Ukraine war started, also would suggest that Syria can basically be sucked into the vortex of Ukraine war mm -hmm. and something a lot bigger as well. So, so I think you know, uh, uh, you know, Syria is much more integrated into everything that's going on uh, than than we sort of notice. And 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 my expectation is that you know th there's a lot more going to happen in Syria, and the U.S. will have to have a serious strategy which is more than what it is now, that Syria is either about the legacy of uh, you know, what happened with Assad and the humanitarian issue and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. sanctions, or that Syria is merely there to, for us to interdict the Iran-Hezbollah line mm -hmm. of fire, that the U.S. will have to commit to Syria in a much more bigger way to confront both Iran and confront 
Russia, and if it is to prevent a much bigger war in the Middle East, which I don't think the U.S. wants, mm -hmm. which means that it has to prevent the main protagonist from actually engaging in a Syrian battlefield. I want to just draw you out very quickly on one, one other point, which is this, the relationship between Iran and Russia and how we've seen it evolve since Ukraine uh, and how those power dynamics have shifted. And in particular, certainly in Washington, growing concern about deepening military cooperation between Russia and Iran, and in particular, Iran's provision of, of drones and, and even ballistic missiles to Russia. How do you see that relationship evolving? And especially, I mean, it sounds like you've referenced some tensions potentially in the relationship. What can we expect to see going forward, though, with Russia potentially actually more dependent on Iran than had been the case certainly pre-Ukraine, pre-Ukraine invasion? I mean, at some level, you would say that the, that the Iranians think that the, Rus the Russians are not going to be in the same boat as Iran for the next 50 years. I'm just sort of throwing a number. You know, the sanctions are not going to come off. doesn't matter what Russia does in Ukraine. You know, now, now they're, they're in a whole new kind of relationship with the West, which inevitably makes them dependent on trade and technology in Iran. That the Russians need Iranians and the Iranians need Russians, and there's now a natural if you want to call it uh, uh, anti-American, anti anti-sanctions, anti-Western strategic view that binds them together, right? So there's a certain level of comfort there. there, there there's, there's, uh, it's not just military. I mean, the Russians rely on Iran for trade uh, that they do with the rest of the world, with, 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 with the Gulf countries, with India, et cetera. A lot of their trade now goes through Iran. It doesn't go through the Red Sea or places that the West can, can, can actually interdict. And so Iran is increasingly important to them, and they're important to Iran. But that doesn't mean that every policy is the same, mm -hmm. and actually they see eye to eye. eye, to eye. Uh, I mean, R R Russia, uh, um, you know, uh, would want to gain its old footprint back in, in Syria, but some of that means that the Iranians have to give up bases, have to cede territory that they've now for three, four years have been, have been controlling. There's a whole dimension of uh, Israel-Russia relations, which has actually worsened over the Ukraine war. Israel, at some point, pivoted completely in the direction of Ukraine. I mean, right now, uh, Russia, uh, Israeli um, attacks in Syria no longer have the old warnings that they gave the Russians that they were coming, right? In other words, there's the deconflicting that used to exist between the Russians and Israelis is not there, whether that can be restored is something different. But I, I also think there's a, there's a lot more transaction there that we don't see. For instance, um, uh, uh, the, why Iran at this point in time decided to actually uh, uh, make the decision to, to give the missiles, and not two months ago, when actually the Russians may have needed it more, has a lot more to do with other things that the Russians are doing in the region, including a much tighter Russia-UAE relationship which um, is both beneficial to Iran, but also annoying at another level. Like the Russians came out and defended UA on the issue of disputed islands that, that they dispute in the Gulf. Or uh, 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 Iranians want, uh, there, there's also Russia, uh, sorry, Syria is also an issue of negotiations between them. And so if, if the Iranians are gonna give something to the Russians, the Russians want something in return, if the Russians, Russians want the, the, the missiles, which you know, would make Iran's position with Europe and the US much more difficult, in return, you know, they want something else. So this is much more of a multi-dimensional negotiation between them. And, and you know, so we have to look at the totality of how Iran is trying to manage Russia and Russia is trying to manage Iran. So I think, Brian, this is a good point to bring you in. And frankly, I'm already, I think, I think there's a very compelling case that's been made already by both Natasha and Vali that we really need to understand Syria now in a much broader geostrategic sense, uh, given the complexity of everything that's happening. Certainly, all of the issues that came with the beginning of the conflict, those remain, those are critical. But beyond those, we also need to understand that, that Syria is now sitting at the heart of a series of regional and even global conflicts. How do you see the evolution of these sort of geostrategic threats as they're playing out in Syria? Thanks, Mona, and thanks to Natasha and Vali and all of you in 
our partners at the Atlantic Council for helping me um, participate virtually because I think this is a really important event on an issue that has been pushed to the sidelines, unfortunately, in our policy and, and political debates. And Mona, to, to answer your question, I was thinking about uh, the last 10 years and the, the trajectory of where the world has been as well as Syria. And that in many ways, uh, Syria and its conflict and the tactics that were used not only by the Assad regime and the strategies uh, deployed with support from Russia and Iran and other actors have really played themselves out in the world um, in ways that some had anticipated and had pinpointed earlier on. And the geopolitical shifts, I think, have been uh, major. And in many ways, I'll, I'll highlight uh, five of them that I think have impacted uh, how we talk about Syria. First, uh, and it's been stated already by Natasha and, and Vali, I think, what we see in the Assad regime and those that have supported it are authoritarian leaders testing out strategy and tactics that have become all too common in other conflicts and in other parts of the world. And those trends in the last decade have been uh, quite negative. If you look at the most recent report by Freedom House uh, about uh, freedom in the world, we're, we're in the midst of a continued down, downward spiral in respect for, for basic freedoms. And uh, the, the Syrian conflict, I think, typifies it. Way back in 2017, Ann Barnard, who used to write for the New York Times, who covered Syria, she wrote a, a really important analysis called Syria Changed the World. And I think in many ways it was yeah. prophetic, yeah. unfortunately, not only on this authoritarian point and that entrenched authoritarian leaders are building alliances with each other, but then they're using tactics to actually advance their agenda. And we see that. Uh, we, that's what's happened in Syria uh, on, on a second front. The use of violence and terrorism against innocent civilians. Certainly, a lot of the, the tactics that were used in Syria uh, by the Assad regime, backed by Russia and, and Iran, uh, are the same sort of tactics that we see playing out in Ukraine. Um, the, the threat of uh, and the use of uh, refugees and migrants, uh, not only pushing people out, of a particular country, but then the political impact that had in Europe, and I think continues to have in uh, our, our own country this, uh, uh, these days, when you see President Biden and former President Trump spending some time on the border recently, where the immigration and migration issue has been used to divide open societies like ours. So the, the, the geopolitics of this, the add to it the disinformation and inf uh, misinformation campaigns that if you if you read earlier works like uh, a really good book by Sam Dagger, who used to cover the Syria conflict called Assad or We Burn the Country, it's not only a portrayal of the devastating impact the conflict had on the people of Syria, it was the early use of some of these tactics uh, that, that were used uh, to, to help authoritarian leaders stay in power. And then I'll close with, the, I think, a fifth one, the impact geopolitically is the impact it's had on the discourse in, in the United States, um, both in terms of policy and politics uh, on Syria. Right now, Syria is not even a political discussion, uh, which is why I think we as policy institutes are, are, are talking about it. There's been a growth of indifference, and I think that's the product of some of these tactics used by authoritarian leaders um, uh, trying to confuse people about the nature of uh, the conflict inside of Syria. And it has had a very real effect in our own community and very directly. Uh, Mona, when, when you asked Natasha the first question of why Syria matters, I thought of this report you were very much a part of that came out five years ago now almost, the, the Syria study group, um, which I think articulated the stakes and why all of this matters. And though, yes, the storyline has moved on, five years later, some of those fundamentals and some of those trends are still uh, quite negative. And I think the thing I'd pinpoint here and why I'm glad uh, this initiative is, is, is getting underway is that it pushes against this indifference. It pushes against what I've called neo-Orientalism that comes from parts of our left and also parts of our right that simply look at conflicts like Syria and importantly, the people of Syria simply as props for debates that we have uh, that are much more about ourselves and our engagement and our foreign policy and less so about the stability in a place like Syria and why it matters for the, for the overall stability of, of the regional system, the state system in the Middle East and, and the world. 
So, so I think uh, the, the this event, and I hope this initiative serves as a wake up call for those who simply have argued uh, earlier at earlier periods in the conflict that we should simply just put a tourniquet mm. on Syria, that we could somehow contain. Uh, the impacts, the negative impacts of what the Assad regime was doing to its own people with support from Russia and, and Iran and other autocrats and simply turned a blind eye to it. Or those who still write reports these days that essentially say, well, we can't really do that much um, because America does more harm than good in the world and, and its engagements in the Middle East, and then simply slap a progressive label on it or a restraint label on it. And I think that's just continuing an unhelpful debate that doesn't uh, recognize that actually there's things that the United States could do, uh, especially with partners in Europe and especially in the region, to not simply tread water, which is, I think, is what's been happening for years. And it, uh, it's this ironic situation where there's an inclination, which I think we've even seen in some of the sessions today, to, to admire the problem, mm -hmm. to name and frame the problem, but not generate <laughs> enough new ideas or political will to actually do something about it and simply shrug, shrug our shoulders and turn away. So, so I, certainly the geopolitical situation has changed, but that trajectory isn't necessarily negative. And I, I hope that what this initiative does is generate new ideas about how to turn those negative trends towards uh, a different direction. Thank you, Brian. That's a great segue uh, to where I'd like to, to drive the discussion. And I think we do all run the risk of admiring the problem um, because of all the complexity that, that uh, Syria entails. But I think, particularly since we are at the launch of the Syria strategy project, it is essential that we all dive a bit more deeply into the U.S. response to all of this, how and why. I think, I think there's a pretty compelling case that's being made that, that one cannot continue with simply more of the same, um, that this situation has evolved into something even more complex, not to mention the level of humanitarian suffering in Syria today, which is at its worst point since the start of the conflict now 13 years ago. Um, Natasha, let me, if I could, start with you in terms of just uh, taking a stab at, you know, I'm not going to ask you to give us a, a new serious strategy, but how do you think uh, policymakers here in town should rethink, reframe the way that they are looking at Syria? And as this policy, as this strategy uh, project gets launched, what are, at least what are some of the key questions that need to be asked and what are some of the more creative types of interventions we could be thinking of? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, Kotaiba and, and Charles will hopefully have an, an answer to that question <laughs> after a year or two. Um, but I, I mean, I would say that the first step is admitting you have a problem. I don't think that the DC community is, is quite there yet. Um, I think that there's a lot of admiring the problem, a lot of uh, almost relinquishing leverage that you do have, um, which has been, um, uh, I think, uh, the wrong strategy, obviously not a strategy. Um, but I do think there are little things, you know, in taking into context the, um, I think, the limitations of policy focus right now on Syria. There are still things that can happen um, when it comes to negotiations with individual actors on the ground in Syria, for example. Um, and that goes for the Northwest, that goes for the Northeast as well. Um, right now, as Brian was saying, we're kind of treading water. And the problem with treading water is that we're treading water while everybody else is, is actually learning and adapting and, and, and doing certain things like manipulating humanitarian aid, being able to circumvent sanctions a lot more. Um, so I think, you know, f for starters, I think in the Northwest and the Northeast, there needs to be a much more robust response to building up the resilience of these of these communities. And that will be through humanitarian aid and more open access to humanitarian aid. Um, but it will also be through additional, more sort of early recovery activities, um, the, the allowance for the private sector to get more involved in these areas as well. And that's going to have to entail some policy changes on behalf of the donors. And it's gonna have to also entail a lot more coordination between donor governments, including the United States as well. Um, because right now, we see this sort of downward spiral for a lot of things, um, and including water security, which is um, something that I've been looking into for the past year. 
And a lot of that relates to the fact that everyone's kind of uncertain as to who's gonna run Northeast Syria in the future. Um, I see that there might be a high chance of the U.S. just kind of remaining and letting it remain stagnant. But the problem is we're seeing horrible drought conditions, the effects of climate change, and water is one of those things that really can't wait for a perfect peace agreement. Um, and so, so I think that's one sort of strategy moving forward. Um, but I, but I do think that there's, you know, a lot of other ways that that we could um, be using more of our leverage. I think one of the things that we've seen um, from the crisis in Gaza is that the region has come together to try to at least deliver a proposal that they're unified by. And I think we could learn a lot from that actually for Syria. Um, if Europe and the United States and the Gulf countries and regional countries actually got together and formulated an actual step-for-step -step approach rather than an approach where each individual actor is sort of making concessions and negotiating on their own, I think you could have an actual more cohesive strategy and actually get some wins, not just from the Syrian regime, but potentially from Russia and Iran as well. But I think without that, you essentially have each individual player um, you know, negotiating one-on-one -on -one with the Syrian regime. And we've seen that they haven't gotten very far with that approach, and it's for good reason, because if you don't, if you're not unified in your approach, then it allows the regime, Iran and others, to be able to easily circumvent sanctions, for example, um, or manipulate humanitarian aid as well, which is our chosen way, I think, of containing this crisis to date. So, Vali, I want to turn to you, and I'm also, we're getting a number of questions in, and I'm trying to pull questions in and also continue this policy discussion. I would love to hear your thoughts on what the U.S., how the U.S. should be thinking about Syria, given Iran's central role, and of course, Iran has now been identified after China and Russia in the latest ODNI report on national security threats. After China, Russia comes Iran. Um, and we see, of course, so much of what Iran is doing in a nefarious way in, in Syria. Um, there's a question here about related, not quite related, but do we see a shift? Is there the potential for Irania, Iran's calculus maybe to shift with respect to its support to the Assad regime? Um, I don't know whether maybe that would refer to what's happening internally in Iran, that Iran gets stretched uh, domestically and is not able to. Um, there, there was also, and I've, I'm afraid I missed this last part of this session, but a reference to a comment by uh, the German special envoy uh, that there may be a point at which both Russia and Iran's support to the regime could be stopped. So is there, is there something more, I guess, that, that the U.S. or the international community can do with respect to support that countries like Iran is provi provides to the Assad regime. Well, uh, on your last one, I would love to hear uh, more about that. I think that's more like a Hail Mary pass that you mm. throw, but uh, it might land all the way in the stands. I'm not sure what, what that yeah. means. But, but uh, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, building on what Natasha was saying, and as we think forward in a sort of a strategy project, I think the really fundamental question to start with is what is the United States' interest in Syria? I mean, generally, actually, I have to say that people in the region are, are quite, uh, um, you know, at a loss as to what is our interest in the Middle East at all. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we sort of have these reactive answers when they've been asked, but it's not actually that clear. So uh, if you looked at uh, everything, uh, even before, on, before we arrived at on, on, until October 7, the game was, you know, can we keep things on a, on a, on a, on a lower boil uh, until we get to 2025 and after the election? But even if people bought into this as a short-term strategy, then what then? So, you know, are you really going to go after Iran in January of 2025, or uh, you know, you're going to solve Syria. Then you're going to deal with these issues. Mm -hmm. So I think you know it's very difficult to sort of uh, think about how we're going to solve Syria without actually saying you know what are what is our interest in this region, right? And then the question for Syria is what is the United States interest in Syria? I, I, I don't think there's an answer to that. If you were to say so, is it? Uh, saving people? Is it dealing with drugs? Is it, is it dealing with Iran? Now, if Iran is going to be a central organizing principle for the United States in the region, 
then you, know, you have to redefine your presence in Syria very, very clearly about it's about Iran. And that, that might change the way you handle Assad altogether. I mean, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. You may actually end up saying, okay, what do you want to abandon Iran, mm -hmm. right? Or you might say we need to actually mm -hmm. remove us. I mean, yeah, I'm saying that, you know, you can answer these questions when you know actually what it is that you want, right? Uh, and, what, and then the question becomes, you know, for, for a study, after you say, okay, what is our interest in Syria? And I'm, I don't know what that interest mm -hmm. is, but Iran may very well be it. Uh, uh, you, would, you would say, okay, uh, uh, what is the outcome that we want, right? What outcome satisfies the United States, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then that goes to the German uh, envoy's point that, you know, is it that, the, that Iran and Russia are completely gone? Is it that they're marginalized? What is it that we claim would be, would be a satisfactory position for the U.S.? Uh, uh, and, and then, you know, the question becomes, okay, what set of policies and steps are required to get us there? Right, uh, and 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 I think, uh, and unless we do this, we can't even get the region to support us. Because you know, what are the Jordanians, or the Saudis, or the Iraqis, or Israelis are hanging their hat on, hmm. right? Uh, you know, w they have to be able to read what is our game plan to say, okay, how do they hitch their wagon to us? How do they support us, right? Uh, and I, I mean, Iran is one piece of it, but I think that another, another big interest for the U.S. could very well be that Syria does not become a hot, you know, battlefront of a kind of a war that we can't even imagine between Iran and Israel and the United States, et cetera. And, uh, and so, so, I, so, I, so I would say it's actually the right time to be doing this strategy report, mm -hmm. because like it or not, the United States is going to arrive back on, at Syria again, and all the points Natasha raised, I mean, Brian raised. But I think that's where we have to start. You know, why does this country matter to the, to the United States? Why does any kind of an outcome matter to the United States? I mean, once President Obama compared uh, Syria with, um, with Rwanda, almost like implying where well, we don't have a dog in the fight in Rwanda, and it's the same. Uh, mm. If that's not the case, mm. we, uh, if, if we really do have a dog in the fight in Syria, which I do believe, I believe we do, then we have to start by defining it. So, Brian, what are U.S. interests in Syria? And, and I want to actually pull in a question from Morhaf Joujati, who asks, given the present and future threat that Assad's Syria poses to the region and beyond, what will it take for the U.S. and its allies to consider regime change? Uh, that's a great question. And let me uh, answer, I think, pretty succinctly. First, the U.S., as well as our European partners, have an interest in the stability of the state system of the Middle East. So long as you have a Syria that you have today, um, exporting drugs, uh, uh, a home to terror networks and militias that undermine state stability, we're, we're, we're not going to have that. Uh, terrorism is a key, a, a key issue. We like to pretend from time to time episodically. We did it before in Yemen in the early 2000s after uh, the USS Cole and other places. We like to pretend like we can just turn away and ignore these uh, issues. We have an interest also in the uh, ideological fight um, in terms of who actually wins out and clearly we're not. We're not winning. If you listen to my remarks earlier, uh, Russia, Iran, the Assad regime is winning. All of that is typically taken by the so-called foreign policy blob to essentially say, well, you're talking uh, about military tools and it, let's use military tools. And those who are critics of it talk about um, military means. And I do think there's an, an important component that the U.S. should maintain the presence that it has to try to deal with the instability that's there and the continued threats. But the thing that's missing uh, after the interest and to the question of where I hope this uh, strategy project goes, in my view, and I've written about this for a while, is a deeper U.S. and European diplomatic engagement with some of the key regional actors. Um, the Biden administration uh, has many different slogans for its foreign policy. On Mondays, it's foreign policy for the middle class. Uh, on Tuesday, it's strong at home to be strong abroad. On Wednesdays, it's diplomacy first. And 
Um, in the instance of Syria, I'd actually try to do more to put that diplomacy first uh, uh, forward, which I, I'm not certain that we see this, uh, especially as this panel and others have described. Different countries in the, in the region just simply don't see the United States lifting up its voice, which is why I think you've had this flawed approach to normalize with the Assad regime coming from the region. Uh, when I go to the region and talk to analysts and leaders in some of these countries, they sort of shrug their shoulders and say, what else are we going to do? Because the U.S., uh, it's not engaged. Europe's not leading. You're all distracted. And I actually think some of the tough discussions that maybe have been happening privately, but we should have a bigger discussion with countries that neighbor Syria, like Jordan, uh, that suffers from some of the negative effects of what's going on. Turkey, certainly, as a NATO ally. Um, Iraq, where the U.S. presence is challenged in many similar ways as it is uh, in Syria. And then, uh, Mona, you and I have been in various working groups on Lebanon. All of this, I think, is a prescription of deeper U.S. engagement. And I know and I appreciate sitting here March 2024, clearly the priority is the Israel-Hamas war and Gaza and Palestine, and it should be. And I'm glad the Biden team uh, is doing more on the Middle East in 2024 than it planned to do in 2021, 2022. But what I would say is that 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 phrase that some in the U.S. military use, by, with, and through, working with those partners, we need um, more than a little bit more U.S. diplomatic engagement, preferably coordinate in coordination with European allies, to actually craft an action plan to 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 shape the trajectory inside of Syria to talk about what could be done jointly. I know there's a bandwidth challenge here. I also know that the, the question of Palestine is necessarily going to dominate uh, this administration. But if we're talking about a long-term strategy um, policy, I think it, 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 it builds on something Natasha said earlier, that there is an impulse in the region right now. Some people don't like it. But there's a much more assertive nature uh, of some of our partners in the Middle East, especially in the Gulf states. And they're, they're going to go their own way. And uh, they're going to continue to do so down a flawed way, in my view, on Syria with its Assad uh, normalization, unless this, the U.S. steps up. And, and actually, this not-so-benign neglect, this treading of water, um, I think it's important as a policy question. But then and I hope we can get to it. I actually think the politics on this aren't as difficult as some people hmm. uh, assert here, here in the United States. Uh, depends on who wins in elections in November in 2024. But as we've seen in other uh, topics on big picture U.S. foreign policy questions, when it comes to China, when it comes to, at least until recently, the Ukraine war, um, there is an ability, if leaders actually lead and lead uh, in ways that stand up to bullies and, and express something that's about our values, I think we're, we're seeing you know, a very comp complicated debate play out on the Gaza war right now. But there's a way to build coalitions to get this support. The, the, the Syria study group that you were a part of, uh, uh, Mona, uh, was a product of some of that. But it didn't uh, uh, go further in part because we had a, a very different president that was quite erratic in how he, he presented himself. So I think some of this um, relies on the U.S. in this new geopolitical context to actually build the relationships, uh, not restrain itself, not pull back from the region, not pull back from the world, but actually invest more, and especially in, in the diplomatic engagement with those who actually are more directly impacted, even though acknowledging that we're, we're also uh, feeling the effects of this as well. Thank you, Brian. So, Natasha, as I turn to you, because I, I want to be respectful of the questions that have come in, I'm going to pull two questions together which touch on your work with respect to um, both Syria's water but also energy resources, if you don't mind, because there are a couple questions here. And the first question is, um, as a supplement or alternative to relying on donors, understanding that donors are themselves somewhat restricted, how can Syria use its own natural resources is the question. Right? I'll let you interpret that however you would like. Um, I'm going to add to it another somewhat trickier question, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's for the panel, but I'm going to direct it to you first. How does the panel respond to accusations that the U.S. is stealing Syrian oil? 
in Syria, in northeast Syria. So kind of help us understand better the nexus maybe of water, energy, yeah. sovereignty. Um, I think it's a good question and it actually points to a, a larger problem that's in Syria, but I would say the rest of the region as, as well. Um, and I'll give you an example. So I've been, I've been working for the past year or so on uh, a paper on water security. Uh, there's gonna be a report coming out this Friday on World Water Day and later a larger piece um, that relates to each of these case studies, including Syria, on why water security matters and particularly why politics in water security matter. Um, right now you have a situation where you do have just a bunch of humanitarian organizations, stabilization organizations, um, you know, trying to get together to deal with the oil pollution um, that is rampant in northeast Syria, trying to deal with uh, the water crisis that is ongoing in northeast Syria. Um, and it's simply not enough. Um, and there's a lot of ways that I think European actors and, and the United States can do more on the diplomacy side, as, as Brian was mentioning. We know uh, that Turkey has a very complicated relationship with the de facto government in northeast Syria. We had an event just a few months ago on the crisis in northeast Syria. And immediately afterwards, I had diplomats writing to me saying, we're gonna meet with Ankara, what are the talking points that we should discuss? More of this needs to happen. There needs to be more dialogue between diplomats that do have leverage within Syria and do have leverage within regional countries to solve some of these energy water issues. And that's necessary, not just for Syria, but I would say for Iraq as well. Um, Syria relies on the Euphrates River for 85% 80 of its renewable water resources. Iraq relies on the Tigris and Euphrates for nearly 100% of its renewable water resources. And we're seeing mass displacement in places like southern Iraq. Um, and there's a lot that can be done internally in terms of domestic management, but I think there's a lot that can be done by diplomats in this context to really create uh, better cooperation around shared resources as well. Um, the second point is harder, but I, I would say, I would just say that Syria also relies on hydropower, so the energy question is, is, uh, is actually part of the water question there as well. Um, on the stealing water, uh, the stealing oil, mm -hmm. uh, interesting question and, and really the question of the day because it's the reason that Northeast Syria has not been able to do more in terms of exporting its oil, um, in terms of infrastructure around energy resources. And that's become very problematic for water resources because of the oil pollution from makeshift refineries over the years. Um, so, I mean, in terms of whether or not uh, it, the oil is Syria's oil, um, I, the U.S. is not gaining anything from Syria's oil. The U.S. is one of, if not the largest energy producer in the world. So there's no sort of oil wars in mm -hmm. that sense anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so at least the intention, I think, is not, is not there. Um, but I do think there's a lot more that we could be doing around um, diplomacy over energy, shared energy and, and water resources in Syria and other countries to sort of manage these crises a bit, a bit better. We're coming toward the end. I want to let Vali, there's a, there's a specific question for you and then I'm going to have a lightning round for the three of you to conclude the session. But the question for you, Vali, is about the U.S. footprint on the ground in Syria. And the questioner seemed to assume that you were thinking there's not a, a, a counter ISIS posture to the U.S. footprint on the ground in Syria, um, that it's more about Iran. Can you mm -hmm. kind of offer uh, either clarification or distinction or in your understanding, what is the purpose of the U.S. footprint on the ground? Um, uh, is ISIS still active in Syria today, um, or is this just uh, uh, is the fight against ISIS simply now been reduced to a, a talking point? Um, so I mean, yes, ISIS is, is, is still uh, is still present in Syria, but, but the perception, particularly in the region, is that it's not at the level that would justify the presence of of U.S. troops, and that there are other solutions for the level of activity. For instance, the Turks often say that you know they could easily 
uh, manage that, or at least they claim uh, that, that that doesn't require the, the, the kind of U.S. presence. But also most of the U.S. activity uh, seems to be actually uh, is engaging that corridor with Iran as opposed to ISIS. Mm -hmm. Most of the battles, most of the uh, you know, uh, tension, it's all around uh, uh, that issue. And when the U U.S. Uh, military recently has been e essentially in line of fire and, and uh, has been engaged, if you would, it's usually been with, with the militias that are basically doing Iran's bidding. Now, you know, in the mind of Pentagon itself, perhaps the, uh, the, the counter-ISIS issue matters a lot more, but, but uh, um, you know, where, where it's being received in the region is that the U.S. is in Syria largely for Iran. Which, you know, goes to the question that you asked earlier, if that really is the case, mm -hmm. then it's, it, requires something, it's to, it requires to be articulated properly with an objective of what's, what do we see as success there? What's the objective of our presence there? Is it downgrade? Is it eliminate the Iranian footprint? Is it to contain it? And then what do we need to do in order to get there, as opposed to sort of pretending we're there for a reason that is not really any longer compelling even to American political argument? I mean, if you were to go to American people and say today that we need to have this many troops to fight ISIS, I don't think it's really an argument. Right, uh, uh, but if we're there to prevent a larger war, or we're there to contain Iran or 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 or, uh, or Russia. It's a it's it's a much more compelling argument given what's happening in the region. ISIS is not shaping the Middle East anymore. Hmm. It's Iran, and it's you know, uh, and it's the wars that are happening. It's the Gaza war. I said that is actually what is going to decide the shape of the region, and I do think the U.S. has a legitimate argument about why it has a stake in what will happen in the Middle East after, after this war with Iran, et cetera. And, and, and given that Syria is going to be sort of the ground zero of that as we go forward, mm -hmm. then it's time that it articulated so, that objective. With that, I'm going to, the, in the remaining very couple few minutes that we have left, I'm going to do something extremely unfair. <laughs> which is I'm going to start with Brian and then work our way back. So Brian, Vali, and then Natasha. And ask each of you to, in a minute or less, give us the key, two to three key planks of what a new, more innovative U.S. strategy towards Syria should include. Two to Great. three. Go, yeah. go so Brian. Number one. Number one, a deeper, a deeper U.S. engagement in the Middle East, especially diplomatically with partners, working by, with, and through to find solutions with them to the problems. Um, number two, I, I didn't answer Morhoff's uh, question from before about regime change. And um, I actually think as think tank analysts, we have a responsibility to talk about concepts like this. It's almost what I hear the phrase regime change. I think about that Disney movie Encanto, uh, the song, We Don't Talk About Bruno, if people are familiar with it. We don't talk about regime change, but you know what? We do. Uh, we do almost every day when people lift up their voice about the Saudi monarchy and say there needs to be some sort of change there. And it's interesting to me that some of the most critical voices of the Saudis or the Gulf regimes are also like, no, 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 no. You can't talk about regime change in places like Syria or Iran. Um, also, some of those voices that are applauding Chuck Schumer, though I don't think he was calling for regime change in, in Israel, but we talk about it. We talk about power transitions and what's uh, needed uh, to be done. I think the reason we don't talk about it, and I'll close on this, is that it, it's used as a conversation closer. It's a knee-jerk reaction, which actually I did myself earlier on when I used to work at the Center for American Progress in my earlier years, is to sort of close off the conversation because we say, oh, well, do you want to return to 2003 Iraq? And it's this false choice that I think uh, the Obama administration largely uh, leaned on for much of the Syria problem. And it's a, uh, it's a problem, actually, to, to not talk about, again, not a military-led regime change, but the thing that uh, Syrian people quite likely might want, which is something different from what they have. And I think the key thing here is to expand the aperture and talk about all of the tools non-military and military that could be done to help the Syrian people shape something that's different and why that matters to the United States is you, you potentially get a more stable region of the world than simply withdrawing and pulling back from it. 
Thank you, Brian. Vali, what two to three key planks of a reinvigorated Syria strategy? I mean, I can't build too much more on what, what uh, Brian said, other than to reiterate what I said at the beginning. I can't think of a, what we would do better until I know what is it that we want to do, right? So I, we have to have that objective before we can say what's the better policy for, for that. But all the elements that Brian said, you know, better diplomatic engagement, et cetera, I think they're all parts of it. Natasha? Yeah, I mean, same. Uh, I think I think Brian covered it, but I would just say, I mean, on the diplomatic perspective, I think we gain more from a unified approach. Once again, I know it's difficult, but I also think that we have far more leverage if it's a unified approach with regional allies um, and European allies. Um, and then there's just one point I wanted to make, which which sort of speaks to to what you were saying. Um, I disagree a bit with, I guess, regional actors saying that ISIS is not an issue anymore. I think ISIS isn't an issue until it becomes an issue again. Mm -hmm. And usually places with high levels of desperation and a protracted sense of injustice don't produce great outcomes. It might not be ISIS, it might be something else in the future. Um, there are also legal reasons which we focus on ISIS being the reason that US troops are there rather than Iran. But, um, but I do think that you know, we need to think about sort of those root uh, drivers of of crises and, and and the conflict itself, and uh, and sort of move forward with some of these, even if it's piecemeal solutions, piecemeal solutions. So before concluding and and thanking our excellent panelists, I want to remind everyone that there will be a ten minute coffee break uh, after this session, and then we'll con come to the concluding session. Uh, with that, please join me in thanking our excellent panelists for a very rich and stimulating discussion. Thank you.
Greetings, everyone. I'm Sousan Abu Zainuddin. I'm the um, CEO of Madania Civil Society Network. I'm very glad to be with you here with the esteemed colleagues um, in the panel. Um, since the morning, we've heard how Syria has become entrenched more and more in a prolonged conflict marked by worsening humanitarian and human rights crisis and a stalemated political process. While regional normalization trends are on the rise, unfortunately, international attention to the Syrian crisis is diminishing. We've heard from our colleagues in the previous panel that the deadlock in Syria is now spilling over regionally and beyond. Addressing the Syrian conflict is therefore no longer merely a domestic issue. It needs to be placed again at the center of international policymaking and diplomacy. We've also heard earlier this day from the representatives of the different governments that the will to find a principled political solution to Syria according to the UN Security Council Resolution 2254 persists. However, concrete strategies to achieve this on the international stage seem to be lacking. Despite this gap, Syrian experts and civil society actors have consistently been at the forefront, not only in mitigating the conflict's impact, but also in putting together strategies to tackle its underlying causes. As a matter of fact, as we, as we gathered here today, many Syrian experts and representatives of civil society organizations were gathering in Vienna, hosted by a Syrian research center, the, the, the Syrian Center for Policy Research, to deliberate on Syrian-led solidarity-based alternative strategies to tackle some critical aspects um, of the Syrian conflict. However, unfortunately, the architecture of decision-making structure and the involvement of multiple national, regional, and international stakeholders, um, including de facto military and political powers inside the country, have rendered solutions beyond the capacity of Syrians alone. In this panel, we will explore how the Syria Strategy Project aims to bridge these gaps in today's policymaking structures in order to leverage existing initiatives and foster robust policy recommendations, all with strong Syrian leadership that can pave the way for a political solution that's ultimately owned by Syrians. I would like to remind everyone in this room and online that you can submit your questions to the colleagues through askac.org. I'd start by welcoming the panelists. We have with us um, Charles Lester, the director of Syria and Countering Terrorism and Extremism Programs at the Middle East Institute. We have Qutayba Edelbi, the director of the Syria Project at the Atlantic Council, and Marie Faustier, the senior advisor at the European Institute of Peace. I'd like to start with you, Qutayba, um, please. Um, after the rich discussions that we've heard throughout the day, could you please um, tell us more about the rationale behind this project? What is it that we're trying to achieve in here? What are some of the outcomes that you're expecting? And what's the process that you're planning um, uh, to implement in order to get us there? Thank you so much, Sosan, and thanks to everyone for joining us on a Monday, our previous panelists and moderators for all of their support and also for um, kind of like warming us up and you know to get into deep into what the strategy of Syria strategy project is about. The rationale behind the Syria strategy project came together from a lot of conversations we were having with Syrian stakeholders um, across civil society, across the political spectrum, but also with policymakers in Washington, in European capitals and across the region. From Syrian stakeholders' perspective, we were always, and from regional actors, we're always hearing the question, what is the U.S. up to? What is the U.S. strategy in Syria? Is? And for sometimes, of course, I mean, it's clear that there is um, a favorable outcome of managing the conflict the way it is. But it was hard, as probably Brian and Valley outlined, it was really hard to outline specific strategy the U.S. is pursuing in Syria. 
And on the other hand, I think a question a lot of policymakers um, or an answer a lot of policymakers in Washington say is that we've tried everything in Syria. Um, we can't really, you know, we've run out of ideas. There isn't much to do in Syria. So we really wanted to answer both. On one hand, um, actually help policymakers, not only in Washington, um, but across different actors in the region and across Europe, to actually figure out what a realistic and implementable Syria strategy could be. And on the other hand, um, um, also really think what solutions we can um, come up with um, to address the conflict as it is today. The situation in Syria today is different from what we've known in 2011, 2012, or even 2015 when UN uh, Security Resolution 2254 was agreed upon. The umbrella of 2254 still is the perfect umbrella to actually reach a solution, um, an actual realistic solution that you know keeps in, in consideration the interest of all parties involved. And it is a resolution that both the United States and Russia agreed upon um, in the UN Security Council. But the situation in Syria today have changed a lot in the sense that we don't we are no longer dealing with um, kind of like a civil war across and an uprising across all of Syria. We have four or five different Syrian territories right now. Um, we have semi-division of Syria. Um, and even the interconnectivity between the different areas of Syria, it is not as um, the way it was when, you know, in the midst of the war in 2012 and 2013. Um, so we need to start from this reality that, you know, this prolonging conflict have created throughout the last decade and try to get to a point where we can actually put political um, uh, transition on the table and move forward with that. Um, so the idea for us, the process was to bring together experts, policymakers, um, diplomats, um, people who have worked on Syria for the last decade, bring them together basically over the next 12 months to discuss over six uh, different thematic groups, to discuss not only what a holistic strategy would look like, but when we look at the details, how can we actually start looking at those sub-problems to address them in a more holistic approach instead of starting um, top-bottom. Um, and the idea is also not only to engage with experts, but also to engage with stakeholders. Um, because I think as we work in think tanks, sometimes we really ignore um, or we really forget that as we work here, it's not only about, as you said, not only about addressing the US, but we also want to produce something that is workable um, for European partners, for regional actors, but more importantly for Syrians themselves um, across the board, basically. <coughs> because this is not, and again, we've discussed this, I think, a lot over the last 16 months. How can we put something together that is not just a theoretical exercise? Um, you know, that will be um, shall decide and not be taken seriously by the parties involved. Um, so we're trying to, you know, um, uh, put those two processes, one with experts and one with stakeholders. But we're also learning from, as the previous panelists mentioned, we're also learning from great stepping stones that, you know, others in D.C. have built. Um, as it was mentioned, um, um, the Syria Study Group at USIB was a great example back in 2019 um, with Munaya Kubian here with us. Ambassador Fred Hoff, um, here at, when he was here at the Atlantic Council, also led a process. So there are, we're not starting from scratch. We are, we're actually building on, on the shoulders of previous um, thinkers and practitioners who kind of like paved this way um, earlier. And the idea is to come out with a strategy um, by March of next year. The one thing we're trying to also do differently is that we want to keep this project as a policy sound board around Syria. So we don't want just to um, issue a strategy and move on. The idea is for, is for this, strategy to be, this strategy to be a living one, where we continue to engage with both stakeholders and experts to address issues that would come up you know, around Syria, as we've seen in the last 13 years. And I can't believe that I'm saying 13 years. Um, so many issues have emerged um, other than the conflict itself. Um, today, I think we're talking more about um, somehow counterterrorism. We're talking about decentralization. We're talking about Captagon. Um, more than we're, we're talking about anything else in Syria. Um, and I really expect that you know, other issues are going to come up in years to come. So we want to have this process ready to address any of those issues while maintaining this um, holistic approach 
that would hopefully lead us um, for a real uh, implementable, realistic solution for the conflict. Thank you, Khtayba. That's very thorough. If I may, I, I want to move to you, Charles. We've heard Qutayba saying that in the heart of the rationale behind this project is the frequent question, what's the US up to? But we've also seen it clearly in the last panel that the project, the relevance of the project appears to have a strong focus on the United States. Could you please elaborate on this and perhaps explain to us the objectives you're pursuing specifically within the US context? Yeah, thank you so much, Sosan. I think it's a, <clears throat> it's a key question uh, which requires some sort of explanation. So, yes, from the, out, from, the, from the outside, this looks like a very US-oriented project, but that's both true and not true at the same time, and I'll explain why. It's true because uh, there is a need, or certainly there is a perceived need, throughout the Syrian, many Syrian communities, throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, uh, and the regional governments for the US to step up. Now, US policymakers will argue that they have and they have done sufficiently, but the perception is that the US is, is sort of behind the, behind the game somewhat. So we do want to be able to try to change that. We do want to, we said right from the very beginning when we were talking about this project that our aim was to bridge gaps uh, bridge gaps between all those communities, within Syrians, between Syrians, between Syrians and the international community, between Europe and the US, between the US and Europe and the Middle East. Um, so we want to bridge gaps, but we also want to fill vacuums. Uh, there's no shortage of ideas about Syria policy, Syria strategy, Syria diplomacy, um, but the, the vacuum is that there's no again, perceived unity of, of interest between all those different actors. And so at, at the heart of it, our, our project is a consultative process. We're aiming to consult as many people as widely as possible, simultaneously and in parallel, in order to try to understand better what a Syria approach to Syria would look like that would be as representative as possible of all of those different viewpoints. So really we're sort of here to, to gather, to convene and to learn, and then to convey some of those findings after roughly 12 months. And as Kateba said, we don't want it to end there. I think there have been many efforts, and I've been part of a bunch of them, to do exactly what we're doing, although on a much smaller scale, but then you release the strategy paper and it kind of just ends there, that's it. It's kind of like a, a paper that you can go and read five years uh, from then, but nothing ever happens with it. So we do want it to, to go beyond that. But you know, principally, the, what's called the Arab Initiative, the regional states process of re-engagement with the regime that we saw last year was mostly a reflection of frustration within regional governments that the US and Europe were quite content with a status quo approach to Syria policy, and that for them, and frankly for us, isn't enough. So they tried what they said was the only other option on the table. Um, to speak very bluntly, because I think we're at that point now, European governments, in every meeting I ever have with them, say, listen, we know more needs to be done, but it's not going to happen until the US sort of decides that Syria needs to change and that the status quo isn't enough. And we heard that you know, from the envoys panel earlier. I think from all of them, they said the status quo is insufficient, the status quo is unsustainable, and yet there's still no energy to change that. And again, that's the kind of the bridge that we want to gap and the, va the vacuum uh, that we want to fill. But to come to the core of your question, uh, or at least what I think you're getting to, is that this isn't all about America. Fundamentally, this is about Syria and Syrians. Um, we've gathered more than 80, possibly I think 90 at this point, of the world's most renowned Syria experts in, in America, in Europe, and in the region, but way more than half of those are Syrians. So we want Syrians, and Syrians will be at the front and center of every uh, part of this process. And of course, it's why we're working with, with yourself and, and Madania at the same time. Um, and whilst we are uh, and have achieved um, the participation of, of many, many governments in the US, Europe, and the region, wait far more Syrian stakeholders are going to be involved in this initiative as, as sounding boards for what is practicable, realistic, and, and meaningful. So Syrians remain at the absolute heart of this, but sat in Washington, certainly as Kateba and I are, um, the, the elephant in the room is that nothing's going to change unless the United States decides that it wants to give something a go. And that's what we are principally trying to change so that uh, Syrians will ultimately, hopefully, you know, benefit somewhat. 
Thanks, Charles. I will come back to you on Syrians being at the center of this, but I want to move to Marie first to ask, um, how crucial is it to have Europe involved of this? Speaking of bridging gaps and the different stakeholders, could you please elaborate on this a little bit? Well, simply, it is very crucial. Um, our project has been designed to be a very transatlantic project, and I think that's an original dimension of this project. Um, we, we would like to include Europe's perspective, Europe's priorities, and to bridge gaps with the US, because it's only with a common uh, approach, vision, and strategy that it would be possible to move forward towards a solution on Syria, uh, alongside with regional actors and, and Syrians. Um, we, we assume that the US will not take the lead on Syria on its own, and that's why it is crucial to have Europe at its side um, aligned on the same approach to, to move forward. And that's also very much our approach with this project, it's to bring uh, stakeholders together. Um, the other reason is that there is a need for strategy in Europe. Um, as, as you know, the EU uh, is one of the key donors for Syria. The EU uh, keeps organizing the Brussels Donor Conference every year. Um, but in Europe, beyond the issues of humanitarian aid, uh, accountability, and, um, and refugee, there isn't much of a, of a thinking. So that's why it would be useful for Europeans to uh, engage on broader issues. Um, and the last point, maybe more uh, Brussels-centric, is that there has been uh, increasing dissenting views within the 27 European countries. Um, to, to give you an idea, the strategy for Syria from the EU was um, uh, adopted in 2017, and it hasn't been reopened or rediscussed yet. And the reason for that is that there is a fear that if there is a discussion again on, on, on the Syria strategy, the European countries will have a hard time to, to, come on a, to agree on a common strategy. So um, also a benefit of this project would be that with a, a common strategy developed uh, through a Syrian-owned process within the framework of the resolution 2254, um, agreed on and or supported by all the stakeholders, then this can uh, uh, be a common ground for European countries to agree uh, on some points. And this may foster more unity within European countries. So that would be an additional benefit. So that's for all these reasons that we will, throughout the project, engage with EU stakeholders and European countries' representatives. Thanks, um, Marie. Um, Charles. Back to you. Um, how would you ensure, if, if, as you said, Syrians are in the heart and center of, of this process, how would you ensure that the policy recommendations or what Kutaiba called the, the, the soundboard for future um, strategies to be devised will lead to a, um, a workable political solution and principled political solution that's ultimately owned by Syrians? Could you please elaborate on this? Yeah, so I think um, for years and years and years there's been this kind of tussle within the international community about what a, what a resolution to Syria would look like. And at times, certainly earlier on in the, uh, earlier on in the, in the uprising and in the crisis, the consensus was, it, it was, was framed around the language that we still hear today. It has to be Syrian-owned, Syrian-led, and, and for Syrians, which I think is a constant. But what we've seen sort of take over in a way, certainly in the second half of the, of the 13 years of the crisis, is the idea that yes, that needs to remain the case, but ultimately a resolution will be something that the external actors will agree upon and impose on Syrians. Um, I think, uh, and I, I'll speak for myself, maybe I'll speak for, for all three of us, that I think we recognize that both of those things can to an extent be true at the same time. Ultimately, if there is to be a resolution in Syria, it's going to have to be a compromise for all parties. But when we're running something which I called earlier a consultative process, I think at the forefront of our minds is the reality that if the international community ever did come up with what they call a, a resolution, if it's not acceptable to Syrians on the ground, it's not going to happen, right? Like it falls apart the second it's signed. Um, which is exactly why we've gone to a lot of work to make sure that throughout that consultative process, not only will we be engaging, uh, as I said earlier, through Madania and civil society, but we will be engaging with uh, de facto authorities uh, in the northwest, in the north, in the northeast, with civil society in southern Syria, which is sort of officially controlled by the regime, but not really. 
um, we've gone to significant lengths to try to achieve um, a consultation with at least actors around the regime to try to understand what might potentially be possible in what others in previous sessions have called a step-for-step -step process. So we want to be able to do both, right? Nothing's gonna happen if the international community doesn't agree that it's worth getting on board. But also, even if they do, nothing's gonna work unless Syrians do. So we want to be able to sort of tick both those boxes, you know, successfully do both of those things. And just one other way of sort of answering your question is, um, in terms of framing our efforts, a, lot, a, a resolution to Syria is almost certainly gonna take a long time. It's not gonna happen quickly. Um, and I think we're very cognizant of that in our, in our project. So we're running on sort of two timelines in terms of our vision for, for, for policy. One is very short term. How can the international community collectively or individually work to better improve conditions in all areas of Syria for Syrians? Um, and that is uh, principally to treat what people call the symptoms of the crisis the refugee and displacement crisis, um, uh, environmental challenges, uh, the humanitarian uh, situation, security challenges, governance on the ground in, in different regions of the country. But ultimately, what we want the strategy to look like at the end, this is us before we've started, but what we want it to look like is the paths to achieve those short-term improvements will pave a path that will make a longer-term resolution more doable. So, you know, idealistically and more sustainable. And more sustainable. I, so idealistically, we want to see many of those symptom treating uh, policies increase or encourage greater interconnectivity between different regions of, of Syria, which, to be honest, exist already right now, but unspoken. You know, HTS trades with the regime. They trade with the SDF. There is trade ongoing between all these hostile regions, but no one talks about it. But if there is a way, if there are mechanisms to make that more in the open, then we start both improving conditions on the ground, but paving a path that makes a long-term resolution much more practical. Thanks, Charles. Okay. Um, Kotaiba, over to you. How would this fit in the complex regional scene today? particularly with the surging normalization trends, but also given the war on Gaza. How do you see this place in this picture? I mean, I think there are a couple of dynamics here. Um, if we start from normalization, I think we need to look at two things. On one hand, on the question of normalization itself, I think the main issue here is that as the United States, we started from kind of like giving more regional agency um, to regional actors, but the problem is when you actually look at regional actors, the only way they can deal with the Assad regime in Syria is to normalize. Like that is the only way for them. They don't have the resources, the assets, the capabilities that the U.S., whether political or otherwise, to do something else in Syria. So yes, I mean, this is, on one hand, this is the only thing probably the region have tried to do, not only in Syria, but if you look in previous conflicts in Iraq, um, you know, uh, after the war, um, uh, before and after the war between Iraq and Iran, before and after the Gulf War, engagement was the only way um, to do things. But on the other hand, um, I think a year after accepting the Assad regime back into the Arab League, it is clear that the normalization process have failed miserably. Um, and this is not an, like an outside assessment. If you ask actors in the region, um, how responsive has been the Assad regime or the Syrian government to the normalization process? There has been zero response. The Assad regime continues to even um, take back in 1,000 refugees from Jordan, refuses to do anything meaningful on Captagon, but also refuses to kind of come to the table with a humble approach um, talking to you know, Arab partners or you know, countries in the region who have already opened the door for him. Um, so I think, in a sense, it is clear that that process did not work. How can we work on something of terms? So where does the strategy fit in? From day one, it is clear. If the United States does not have a clear strategy and if it, it is not involved, nothing, to be honest, is going to be resolved um, in, the, in a magic way that we would imagine if we just you know, pack everything and go. And I think the last decade, 
um, not only in Syria, but also on Gaza and, and other places, has been a clear evidence of that. Um, in the last, I mean, just to like jump quickly to Gaza and then I'll go back to Syria, the main process on Gaza has been for the last probably five, six years has been the Abrahamic Accords, just focusing on normalization between Israel and partners in the region um, and completely forgetting Palestine, the aspirations of Palestinians and everything related to what Palestinians, especially in Gaza, has been going through. Um, the siege on Gaza has been going for longer than the Syrian conflict has been going, uh, ongoing. And that has all been forgotten. And because of that, you know, for, you know, since probably 2014 or 2015, there was this um, kind of like um, uh, completely approach to, you know, Southeast Asia dealing with Russia and forgetting about the Middle East. And we had to be dragged back to the Middle East since October 7th because we have been ignoring these, we've been dealing with some of the symptoms or we've been ignoring the problems um, of those um, conflicts in the region. So the problem is, and that's why like a strategy is needed, is because if we don't deal with the issues we have in ha on hand in Syria today, the way the conflict might re-explode in the future actually is beyond anyone's control, I believe, whether in the region or for us as the, as the United States. When in 2014, when the um, counter-ISIS coalition was formed, we dropped almost half billion dollars in one day in equipment and support. It was just like, okay, let's help partners on the ground. We need to counter ISIS. That's, that wasn't a small investment to do. Um, and I understand, of course, like today there are so many calls for you know, the U.S. to withdraw from the region. But I think as long as we don't deal with those issues, we're gonna, be ha we're gonna have to be dragged back to the region and put, yeah, if in 2014 we put half a billion dollars and we're still dealing with ISIS today, ISIS is not over, I can't imagine what the size of investment is gonna be just financially as U.S. policymakers talk about budgetary issues today. What size is the investment is going to be 10 years from now? But also more importantly, what's the impact of, um, of such conflict on communities in the region is gonna be like? which is completely missing right now from policy conversations. So that's why actually by talking to um, stakeholders in the region, by trying to work on them on if an engagement is going on, let's actually see how this engagement would be fruitful to bring back the Assad regime to 2254 in the absence of a clear track between um, the US and Russia. So how can we rework things that are happening in the region? And again, to address um, interest of um, actors in the region, because as, as Charles mentioned, as we work on a solution for the conflict, we do have to deal with the symptoms, not only in the sense of the overflowing symptoms of refugees, of Captagon that countries in the region are suffering from, but also we need to deal with the symptoms that Syrians are suffering from. It is no longer acceptable that over half of the Syrian people do not have identification documentations. This is not acceptable. Um, it is not acceptable that in a way um, basic services, not only related to identification, related to real estate registry, related to certifying education um, uh, and schools, is, not, is a big issue that no one is able to address. It is no longer acceptable that almost 4.5 million children continue to be outside of school. Those are symptoms that we can address, that the same parties to the conflict today in Syria have been able to address before, but suddenly because of this um, you know, protracted conflict, because of the lack of interest from everyone, even those basic things continue, uh, discontinued um, you know, from being provided to the Syrian people. So we need to deal with those symptoms for the Syrian people, for countries in the region, while, as Charles mentioned, we are working on a long-term holistic um, solution for the conflict overall. Thanks, Khutayba. Um, Mary, over to you. It is pretty complex inside the country with informal relations um, being forged behind closed doors, but also regionally. Who are the stakeholders that you're trying to engage with throughout this process so that you can address some of these complexities? Well, we're going to try to engage with all the stakeholders, basically. That's uh, our ambition. Um, and that's also what may differ with this project from other consultative projects. 
Um, so the idea is to cons consult with all the stakeholders who have been involved in Syria at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level. level. So practically it means that as we develop our uh, ideas, um, strategy throughout the, the consultation with our uh, experts within groups, in parallel we will um, engage with the stakeholders, um, Syrian parties, regional countries, international powers, to, um, to discuss with them our ideas and to, uh, to hear their perspective. Um, because as, uh, as Kuteiba said earlier, it's, the idea is not to do a, a theoretical project. What we want to do is something realistic and implementable, uh, not a nice paper that will sit on a shelf. Um, and for this, we need to, to check with stakeholders their perspective and how, uh, to what extent they are uh, ready to engage with the ideas we develop. Um, so that's one of the strengths of the, of the project, um, it's to have this reality check. And, and that's essential because, um, as, as Kuteiba just explained, um, the, the three levels are so intrica intricated that there cannot be a solution without bring, bringing the three of them uh, in the same direction and um, in a coordinated way. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, um, the rationale behind uh, engaging with all the stakeholders throughout our project. Thanks. Um, Mary, um, I guess I'll, I'll go back to, to some of the discussion earlier today. We've heard a lot on the political process, its relevance, Constitutional Committee, Resolution 2254, but we've also heard uh, a, a controversial discussion on sanctions, on general licenses, um, aid policies, whether these related to humanitarian aid, all the way to early recovery, stabilization, and the prohibited conversation on reconstruction. These are all um, instruments, um, tools, approaches, maybe, or simply themes that have been explored in the hope of attempting to, 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 to tackle, to address um, the Syrian conflict. How are you planning to engage with these topics? Will these be part of the, the, the key issues that you engage with? And if so, how would you engage with these in a way that may generate um, different outcomes? It's already been 13 years. These have been the same key words from the very beginning, a decade ago. How, what is the change that we're um, trying to uh, 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 to reach by engaging with these topics over again. That's, this is a question for for everyone. Please go ahead. Please. Uh, me? Okay. <laughs> um, so I think uh, Salsan, you did an excellent job of laying out certainly not all, but many of the key aspects of of Syria policy from any number of different governments' perspectives, and of course from Syrian perspective too. Um, and I think in so doing, you show just how complicated the issue is. So we're not naive. We are aware that given how broad a spectrum of people will be engaging with, we are not going to get everyone to agree on sanctions policy or uh, you know, cross-line and cross-border aid or any number of these issues. Um, so we are aware that whatever approach we end up sort of concluding on in, in roughly 12 months' time, it's going to offer a range of different perspectives. Um, so we, yes, we're not, we're not coming into this uh, with a naive hat on uh, at all. But we do feel like these issues all need to be discussed. And we have, um, I forget whether, whether Kateba in, in, in his first remarks laid them out, but we have six thematic focused working groups, which will operate independently in parallel to each other, but working along many of those issues that you talked about from security uh, dynamics inside the country and security issues to humanitarian aid and humanitarian issues to governance uh, in different regions of the country to prospects for an economic recovery in the country. And so in many respects, many of those issues listed will feed into more than one of those working groups, which I actually think will, will be helpful. We, we've got the hard job in trying to sort of hash that all together and make it look um, logical at the end of it. Um, I guess the easiest way of answering your question is to say we can't, even though all of us work on Syria full time, we can't go into this process with, with sort of pre-gamed conclusions about what the policy should look like. We have to go into this with an open, an open mind, uh, knowing full well we're going to hear some very different perspectives, particularly on issues like sanctions, which is just, 
you know, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of delve into this too deeply unless, unless we want to, but, you know, sanctions policy is so driven by uh, perspectives, which aren't always entirely accurate. Um, but absolutely no doubt that sanctions policy from any government shouldn't be there in and of itself without there being a wider policy. And that's the elephant in the room right now, is that sanctions are kind of the stopgap uh, whilst there is no other real policy moving on anything, we just have sanctions in place to hold our principles. Um, and sanctions policy will always um, uh, uh, negatively affect uh, civilians in one way or another, unintendedly, if that's, if that's a word. It's, it's never the intention. And that's all the more reason why they, sanctions can't hold a policy together for 13 years. Um, and that, you know, that's just one example of how I think, you know, we will be discussing and debating um, with these working groups for the next 12 months. If I can add to it, maybe, I think the idea also is to, to take stocks of each of these issues, to see what is working, what is not working, and maybe the way it was discussed in, earlier pa in the earlier panel was um, from, a, from foreign countries' perspective. And I think we will discuss it through like the impact on Syrians on the ground and uh, what can be done to improve things for Syrians. So that would be also a slightly, I mean, not slightly, that would be also a different lens uh, through, we, through which we will look at it. Um, so yeah, the idea is like looking, looking at what is working, what is not, how to improve things for Syrians. Um, and one can also help uh, make the whole equation move because in the end everything uh, or almost everything is interconnected also and impact each uh, many issues impact others um, so I think that's with the, at least these two um, methods or approaches that we will uh, tackle these uh, issues you mentioned thanks I mean, I think whatever as yeah. you reflect on this, I also want uh, uh, um, to put in one of the questions that we've received um, from the audience, because part of this is the discussion on sanctions. And we have a request to hear how you would comment on the recent anti-normalization bill. So could we also please reflect on this a little bit in your intervention? Um, OK, I mean, let me try like on the first one, on the thematic groups. Um, I think this is very important, going back to Syrians. I think we do realize that um, a strategy for Syria and a solution in Syria is going to take time. Whether Syrians can wait or not, I think this is up to Syrians who are living under those conditions um, and their families. This is up to them to decide. Um, as Syrians, of course, we're part of that, but we can't really, as like think tanks, as uh, uh, policy institutions, we can't really decide on behalf of the Syrian people. But I think the most important part is whether Syrians want to wait that long or not. I think what is right is to at least make sure, uh, uh, make sure that we are addressing the conditions that they're living in right now and making sure that we can improve the conditions that they're living in right now to the best way possible. As I said, you know, I remember working on, on policy and research back in 2012 and 2013. One of the issues I was looking at what kind of trade was happening back then between first the Syrian government, the regime, and Nusra, the Nusra Front, and then what kind of agreements were in place with ISIS as well. Um, of course, and like, you know, before all of that, of course, all of the rebel groups and um, um, de facto authorities that were in place in different areas of Syria. Not in a conspiratory way, but what kind of services were actually in trade. And if you look at the list, everything was in trade. Um, access, transportation, energy, water. Um, so in a way, there was at least some understanding that we need to at least make the basic functions you know, available. Even to some extent, you know, in some areas in Syria, the regime still pays the salaries of public employees in areas across Syria. So why can't we actually put some of those sectors, again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, to work in at least providing the basic services to Syrians as we work on, as I said, like the more holistic um, um, solution and the strategic, um, the strategy umbrella. So that's, I think, where the thematic groups will also come in play, not in terms of just looking where they fit in the holistic strategy, but also looking at the low-hanging fruit that parties can work on, um, starting with Syrians and getting to the region, and then hopefully to one place maybe where the United States, Russia, and Iran can actually discuss realistically um, what the futures of Syria um, would look like. 
Um, on sanctions overall, I think, um, as Charles mentioned, um, this is all what's really important about sanctions is to be part of a bigger policy. Um, because yes, um, I think sanctions is an impactful tool. It has its side effect. Um, I don't want to step into medicine, but I, uh, the way I would compare it, it's the chemotherapy um, for um, a cancerous um, um, policy in a sense. Um, so, but what's really important is how does this policy um, fit within the overall strategy? And I think this is where the serious strategy project um, is going to fill in one of the main gaps, is trying to bridge between the existing sanction policies. Not only the, a lot of people, I think, there's an overhype over the, you know, Caesar Act, the Anti-Normalization Act. But the biggest and probably the most impactful serious sanction program is the Syria Accountability Act of 2003. Um, or 2004, that was actually implemented after because of the regime's policy in supporting destabilization in Iraq and Lebanon. Um, it wasn't really a result of the conflict, but it was, or a response to the conflict, but it was a response to the nature um, of the regime itself. So again, the question is today, whether for the Anti-Normalization Act, for the Caesar Act, but also for the Syria Accountability Act, how do those policy tools fit within a larger strategy that can lead to um, a full or real implementation of UN Security Council 2254. Thanks, Kotaiba. Um, um, Marie, another question to you um, from the audience. You've touched briefly about the importance of placing this within the framework of 2254. How would you ensure, as leaders of the Syria programs in these um, institutions, that the outcomes of this endeavor of, of this project will be integrated within the, the, the framework of 2254? Well, the, the, the resolution 2254 calls for a transition, uh, a transitional political process uh, through elections. So it, uh, it, it leaves uh, room to, to, to be creative and, uh, and, and find a path um, that fits this condition, but also can uh, can include the the, the, the ideas and the, the recommendations that our experts uh, will come together with. Um, and also at, at this stage, um, none of us wants to to um, set any prerequisites or um, or yeah give any prescription. This is um, the the strategy and and the ideas will really come in a consultative way through the working groups of experts, uh, through engagement uh, with advisors and with all the stakeholders. Um, so um, this is uh, this is the guiding principles that we have in mind, and uh, and then we we will uh, we will work on the specifics uh, collectively. I think to add to Marie's point, if you allow me, I think. We ensure that by working closely with the different stakeholders. And at the beginning, the, one of the main also stakeholders is the special UN Special Envoy. Um, because in a way, this work is to actually complement and fill in the gaps of the work of the UN Special Envoy, who in a sense has been left alone um, for the past few years as, as different governments and policymakers have been doing their own thing. Um, and kind of like leaving a lot of questions for the UN Special Envoy and his team. So while we talk to all of the you know, stakeholders, we will also be consulting very closely with the UN Special Envoy to ensure that, yes, our work is taken, our, our, the strategy is taken to work basically by him and his team. Thanks. Charles, another question. How do you think um, dealing, how would you, in, throughout this project, how would you dealing with an American populace that's turning more and more um, anti-interventionalist? And back to Valley's point earlier, when or if Trump comes back, how would you approach the fact that he might try, he might try to pull the troops mm -hmm. again? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of ifs and buts there. Um, some of which I, th I hope remain ifs and not, not reality. Um, I think, um, where to start? I mean, I think it's, this, is, this is a problem that's not unique to the United States. I, if I put my British hat on, I can say it's very, you know, still very much reflective, I think, of, of, of European, uh, per, per, you know, per perceptions too, um, as well as 
the situation we have here in the US. Um, the kind of the specter of Iraq and Afghanistan haunts um, policymaking uh, communities when it comes to, to the Middle East. I, there's nothing we can really do about that. But I can't speak for what this project is going to advocate at the end of the 12 months of consultations. But as a Syria analyst, and going to the previous panel where they raised the, the regime change, you know, I don't want to talk about Bruno kind of subject. Um, you know, we're not, I'm not uh, anymore. Those days of, of advocating for some kind of bold interventionist regime change policy, I think, are long gone. Um, and so I don't think that a US government, whoever is in the Oval Office, will ever find themselves advocating for an interventionist policy. Principally, what needs to happen, I mean, who, if anyone doesn't already acknowledge that the situation in Syria is unfathomable and should not continue, if there's anyone out there who doesn't accept that, then they don't know anything about what's happening in Syria. So any Syria policy, whatever it looks like at the end of this 12 months or, or if we extend it longer and continue to consult, will ultimately be driven by that reality, that the conditions inside Syria have to change. And to get there, there has to be a resolution. To, to label that like interventionist or regime change or whatever we want to call it is, is I think, um, uh, you know, uh, I forget the, the word, you know, it's, it's, it's dishonest. Um, that's not the goal here. Um, and the fact that we have had such significant buy-in from, from the Syrian expert community, from the Syrian stakeholders, um, it doesn't seem to suggest to me that people see this as some kind of, you know, imperialist Western strategy to intervene in Syria. Well, I think they realize that there does need to be an international consensus and there does need to be an international effort. And the regime will paint anything as interventionist, of course. I think that's a given. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the policy, whatever it might look like, isn't worth pursuing. And, and you know, just on that, uh, to sort of preempt any other question, which would be, what do you do when the regime doesn't want to well, doesn't want to engage or doesn't want to play ball with any kind of political process? You know, again, with my analyst hat on, not necessarily as the co-director of this project. Um, the military challenge to the regime that was in earlier years of the crisis was very, very significant, and we never saw the regime bend an inch. But there was a reason for that. It had those two stalwart Russian-Iranian allies in its corner that it knew would always step up to protect it from a military challenge. But in 2024, there is no regime ally anywhere in the world that is capable or willing of bailing it out economically. And the economic crisis in Syria is catastrophic right now. And it is still only getting worse. And as a result of that, the humanitarian conditions in Syria are appalling in every corner of the country. And they're not getting any better either. So I think, again, in terms of like the timing of this project, I think we do feel like um, the regime doesn't have a veto forever if this deadlock continues. The regime will continue to care solely and pr pr primarily about itself. But as we've seen in Sweden, people have taken the extraordinarily brave decision to step up precisely because there is a deadlock and humanitarian conditions are so appalling. Um, and I'm not saying there's going to be some nationwide uprising tomorrow, but the regime feels that pressure. It is sensitive to it. And even on a micro level, the regime has introduced some very, very small reforms, including within the security sector, over the last six months. And I've no doubt that that is, at least in part, because of the conditions on the ground, because the Arab regional countries have been engaging. So there is a, just a glimmer of flexibility. Um, but if the effort was not just regional, but international, mm -hmm. we might stand a better chance of actually pushing that boat forward. So, Charles, if you would put back your hat as a co-director mm -hmm. of this <laughs> project, and given, um, given the, what you've just went through, particularly in terms of regime change, there's a very direct question to you in here. Will you be putting the subject of military regime change back on the table? Is this something that you're willing to engage with in this project? I mean, I would say, strictly with my co-director hat on, we can't be against anything. We will hear every perspective. It doesn't mean that that will be the conclusion in the, in the policy document that will come out of this. But of course, we will hear everything. We will hear uh, regime perspectives that say there's nothing wrong, the regime has won, and we should leave it all alone and leave. We'll hear that too. 
Um, but we have to piece together all of those perspectives to come up with something that, again, as, as Kuteba said right at the very beginning, is realistic, uh, is meaningful, and is implementable. It's actually possible to do on a multilateral level. Thank Another general question, if you could briefly um, reflect on it. Um, what is the end goal of this project? And how do you think this project might lead to implementable activities on the ground? Could you please briefly reflect on this? Kuteiba? I mean, happy to take this on first. Um, I mean, I think the main goal is, as Charles outlined, um, to create a consultative process where we're filling in the gap um, within policy circles that has been existing at least since the peak years of the um, interest um, in the conflict in Syria has been dwindling. Um, so if we want to look at that from kind of like an operational level, um, if you want to look back at 2015 and 2016 and look at actually policy today, we see teams working on Syria, you know, getting smaller. On the government side, we see um, outside the government and think tank community, people who are interested also, like people are shifting away to other topics. So even in a sense, if let's say, you know, the stars are aligned and there is a moment where something on Syria could happen, all the people who are working, I mean, it's really, I can't imagine really like a very good process where you can bring everyone together and come up with a strategy or a plan the moment something like that happened, because there is no process that actually puts that in place. Um, so the idea is to at least have that process in. And again, put something or um, suggest something, something initially as a strategy, as a holistic strategy. But that's why we want to keep it alive, because conditions are going to change. And we, re we realize that whether it is in the US or anywhere else in Europe or in the regions, conditions are continue to change. Um, the world, I know it's over-exaggerated, um, a third of the world or 40% of, of countries in the world are electing this year. Um, it doesn't always mean a big change, but it does actually, I mean, especially in the US and Europe, it's not, it is gonna signal change. And more importantly also for like more multilateral through the UN, it's also gonna mean a lot because a single vote in the UN actually means a lot, whether on the General Assembly level or, or different committees. So we want to be there basically as a supportive process for policymakers um, to actually do something meaningful on Syria. And I think this is the like the best service probably we as um, policy thinkers, as think, tank, think tankers can provide, not only to the Syrian people, but also to policymakers across the US, Europe, and the region. And maybe just to add um, that the strategy is not the end of the project. Uh, once the strategy is, is ready, we will continue engaging with policymakers uh, to see how this can be implemented. Um, so it's, uh, it's a longer term, uh, longer term uh, goal and, and, and outcome. Thanks, um, Marie. Kuteiba. I want to go back to you because there's another very direct question asking, um, you've mentioned earlier uh, uh, discussions about a US withdrawal from Syria that are happening within Congress and the administration. Again, do you think this is something that the project will be engaging with, the, the, the possibility of a US withdrawal on Syria and how this would affect the Syria policy of Europe and regional stakeholders? I would say what we will discuss is what a meaningful US presence in Syria would look like and how does it fit with an overall regional policy, something that Valley, Brian, and Natasha also have, have touched on before. Um, because again, I think the discussion about staying or leaving by itself that we see right now, in a sense, is meaningless because it doesn't really talk about the context of us staying or leaving. Um, staying in Syria is very much, you know, connected to whether we stay in Iraq or not, whether um, what is the shape of staying in Iraq looks like, but it's also connected to whether there is, you know, in the future there will be, um, you know, a revival of a, a Turkish uh, American uh, military cooperation or not. Um, because that is the, the logistics around um, staying in Syria or not. Because So at the end of the day, for example, it's, it's not only about like a policy decision here, 
It's also about the practical and political um, situation on the ground and around Syria. So that's you know from one side. And from the other, as I mentioned, I think it's really important, like sanctions, um, like um, reconstruction, like any other policy, we need to see how each one of those pillars fits within a, a larger holistic policy and not look at each one of those items by itself. This is what we can promise in terms of the discussion. And my last question, are you not worried that China might step in as a stakeholder, particularly when it comes to uh, the economic side of, of things by placing itself as an ally to the government um, of Bashar al-Assad? Uh, I will start um, by answering that there has been this question and, and hypothesis at the beginning of the uh, conflict in Gaza, um, and so far the answer has been no. Um, so, to me, I think uh, diplomatically it's um, it's not the uh, most likely possibility, and uh, and economically so far we we haven't seen China. Um, um, making steps into this direction. So, and, and the, the sanctions remain uh, 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 significant obstacles to, to any, um, any, any investment or cooperation. So I, I don't think that's the most likely scenario, but I'll, I'll leave my yeah. colleague to add to it. I mean, I would, I would say quickly, I mean, I think definitely China is keeping an eye on what's happening in Syria. But if you wanna look realistically, right now there isn't much for, for China to really get in Syria. If you want to talk about both political and, more importantly, financial investment. And I think the same thing, um, I think regionally when, if you want to step away from China for a bit, when the normalization happened last year, I think the regime was really looking at the region and this, you know, and the same outlooks that Saddam did um, after the Iraq-Iran war, when Saddam basically came to the region was like, give me six billion dollars. Um, so I can, you know, defend, you know, this uh, Eastern Front against Iran. And I think the regime is coming with the same, with a similar mentality as in like, give me a lot of money and I'll see what I can do about Iran. The difference is the regime has changed a lot. I don't think policymakers in the region right now are willing just to throw money around when they don't see a return on investment. And I don't think the regime can actually really provide a realistic return on investment, not only in, only in terms of reconstruction money that might come in or not, but also in terms of the resources that the Syrian government has access for right now. Um, last year, I think the, you know, um, if you look at the Syrian uh, government budget, I think the Syrian government was broke by almost 95%. So if you are not ab even able to fulfill the almost $3 billion annual budget you have, I don't see what is there for China to get, especially you know, after Russia and Iran has already maximized on what they can get out of the cake. They've already signed, you know, the Syrian government has already sold Syria's strategic infrastructure to Russia and Iran for at least 50 or 100 years to come. And this is a challenge, this is something not for, about, it's not only about the regime, it's a challenge I think also Syrians need to deal with because it's an agreement between the Syrian state and the Iranian state, the Syrian state and the Russian state. So it is something to tackle, but looking at that, yeah, I, I really wonder from you know, the perspective of policymakers in, in Beijing if there is anything for them um, to get there. Charles? Just very briefly, because time's running out, say that China has been very risk averse around the world with its engagement um, in governments, and primarily it's focused on economics. Mm -hmm. So given those two things, risk aversion to unstable environments and a focus on economics, China, in, China is not going to you know, throw all of its cards into the, the Assad regime's lap anytime soon. There is nothing to gauge, uh, sorry, nothing to gain uh, economically and everything to lose from a risk uh, perspective. Um, and so China will continue to do what it has done, which is to keep a close eye on conditions in Syria. It will use the UN Security Council to periodically sort of make its views known uh, when it feels appropriate. 
Um, but the only chance China of, of, of stepping in would be like a Yemen scenario, which we saw about a year ago, when there was kind of a deal already primed on the table between the Saudis and, and, uh, and the Houthis. And the Chinese, what they practically did was stepped in and took that deal and said, we have facilitated this. This is something that we own. But it wasn't something that they had negotiated. But we're a long way away from that in Syria, too. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Khutayba and Marie. We all look forward um, to seeing the results of this thorough consultative process. Um, we'll end here, but please welcome with me Tuqa Nusayrat, the Director for Strategy and Operations at the Atlantic Council for the concluding remarks of today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I just want to thank the speakers for their time and all of you for participating today. I also want to thank our partners, um, the Middle East Institute, the European Institute of Peace, and the Madania Civil Society Network. And I want to give a special shout out to my colleague Kuteba, whose dedication to this work is really unparalleled. Um, today's discussions are a sobering reminder of the importance of addressing the aftermath of the Syrian conflict head on and not pushing it to the sidelines. We owe this uh, first and foremost to the Syrian people who have suffered extensively for 13 years. And now more than ever, the work of the Syria Strategy Project is needed to illuminate a realistic path forward and provide actionable policy recommendations to the transatlantic community to address this crisis with Syrians as an integral part of the work. Thank you for those attending today, and we hope that you'll continue to follow the important work produced by this effort in the coming months.